So, yeah, thanks for uh, joining in today. We're on Talking Hoops number five. We'll get straight to it. We're talking analytics today. Uh, for those that don't know, this thing kind of started to grow organically, just uh, some people talking ball, and we just want to keep that conversation going and invite more people in. So real quick, I'll bow my head, and, and we'll get into a quick prayer, and then uh, I'll introduce the speakers for today, and then we'll roll with it. So uh, all that being said, here we go. Dear Lord, thanks so much for this day. Thanks for continuing to bless us. Please watch over our families. Keep all of us safe during this time, uh, mentally and physically. We pray for a great connection to learn, uh, grow, and share uh, during this Zoom call today. And we just pray we can get a lot from it, that we can impact lives uh, as we learn. So all these things we say in your name, Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, so today we're going to uh, have three a trio of speakers. Um, our first two speakers have a past where they work together at Columbia. Uh, our first speaker is Adam Hood. He's an assistant at UTSA. Um, he played Division One ball at Air Force, uh, has a background in Columbia, so he's definitely a high intellectual guy, how he looks at the game. But he's just going to introduce some ideas and concepts that he has from Columbia, uh, as well as some things that they do at UTSA. Uh, and then we'll be followed by um, uh, Coach Hubdy, who is the associate head coach at San Francisco, who was also at Columbia, um, played ball at Richmond, and uh, they've done a great job. Uh, both guys have done a great job in their programs as far as winning and establishing a culture uh, of consistency and of being efficient in what they do. So um, real quick, I'll pass the mic to Lamont, and then we'll uh, let uh, Adam get started. What's up, uh, guys? See, we got a lot of, lot of new faces, I think, on, on the call today. Excited for everybody to be here again, just piggybacking on Coach Burton, you know, all about growth, man. How can we impact uh, our student athletes um, and how can we grow? Uh, great time right now, as we all know, in this quarantine. Uh, with some of you guys, I'm sure states are starting to open. Uh, I'm in California and we're still in, in straight lockdown uh, mode over here. But, uh, but excited about uh, Adam Hood and what he has to offer. Um, I know it must be a great day today, Hoodie, because because Bro Co Coach Burton got it chopped up for you, man. He looking real good with the cut over there, man. Got a nice shave. Looking brand <laughs> new, man. It's official, man. You know, it's official. But uh, let's have some fun with it, man. I see you repping the UTSA, and I'm just glad I don't have to figure out how to guard Jackson and Wallace anymore, man. I got the hell out of that league, so I didn't have to figure out how to, how to stop two 30-point scores a night. But uh, let's have some fun with it today. Let's all be engaged, and, and uh, let's offer up some great questions, and uh, let's grow. And, and congratulations, Coach Hood, on your newborn one-week-old baby. Coach Hood was oh. adamant that he, he get on here to get some time away from baby life. So salute to him. Yeah. Oh, awesome. yeah. That's you awesome. Don't, you don't know it's the experience. <laughs> you got experience. But no, again, I, I'm very thankful to be, you know, a part of this. And again, Brian, Lamont, you know, I've done a great job with this thing. I've been, you know, jumped on. I wasn't, you know, the, the inception of it. But again, hopefully early on, you know, I mean, I've, I've been a, a part of this thing and, and it's been awesome. So again, I'm just going to share, again, I'm just going to call this basically Analytics 101. So again, I'm assuming you have no base in it. And if you have more then obviously great, but I'm just gonna break it down from the beginning and kind of how, how it's explained to me. Because again, it, this was something that, that I learned. And so it wasn't something that I grew up in. And I'll just, I'll just go back that. So I'm gonna share my screen. I'll let the host has disabled it. Uh, let me see, let me see. All right, try now, hoodie. Okay. Good. Uh, yep. So, again, we're just gonna go through it. And again, we're just gonna this is just a brief overview. Again, what is analytics? We're gonna go like Kenny Smith versus Charles Barkley when they're kind of on TNT. They have a little, again, little little back and forth about it. And it's Charles was a player, was a really good player. You know, a guy like like. Kenny Smith's trying to be a GM. You know, he was he was up for the for the Sacramento Kings. So again, he's got to have he's got to he's got to be more open and receptive to it. And we're gonna go through why I'm a believer. We're gonna talk about just more than just twos and threes. We're talking about the mid range. Talk about corner threes, popular analytics terms. And then if you want to incorporate some stuff, where should I start? And then also just kind of give the Division One averages just across the metrics that some of the ones that I spoke about. So I'm gonna do this little clip real fast. Over 
have you to say. <laughs> I, I just try to try. Well, I think the one thing that you know, <laughs> there is something, there's something about analytics. However, your analytics can change over the course of a year by how you play different people and how guys improve. So the improvement of your team also dictates your an analytics. When I first came into the NBA, my first five years in the, in the league, I took 82 threes. In five years, I only took 82 three-point shots. After no that, I took, okay. after, after the fifth year, I took 82 in probably 40 games when I got to the Rockets. It was because of what it is. But if you looked at my analytics, you said, well, this guy's not a three-point shooter. But I became a three-point shooter because I had a big beast mode in the middle that drove two men. So I'm like, okay, I'll stand out here and shoot, start shooting threes. So that's why analytics, analytics don't analytics. work. That's, well, that's, that's why analytics, analytics, don't, analytics, don't, analytics don't, don't work. Analytics don't work at work. all. Crap. It's yeah, just a crap to some nothing. people who were really smart made up to try to get in the game because they had no talent. Because they had no talent to be able to play. I agree so, with you on that. So smart guys wanted to fit in. So they made up a term called analytics. Analytics don't work. What analytics did the Miami Heat have? What analytics did the Chicago Bulls have? What analytics do the Spurs have? They have the best players. They have coaching staffs who make players better. And like I say, the Rockets sucked for a long time. So they went out and paid uh, James Harden a lot of money. They got better. Then they went out and got Dwight Howard. They got better. They had Chandler Parsons. And no, this year they went out and got a reason. The NBA is about talent. All these guys who run these organizations who talk about analytics, they have one thing in common. They are a bunch of guys who ain't never played the game and they never got the girls in high school and they just want to get <laughs> in the game. <laughs> so again, that's a, it's it's a interesting, interesting viewpoint there. But it's, it's also, some people view it like that. And so again, I'm just gonna run through it. Uh, and again, my beliefs and some of the things that, that I've learned along the way. And then again, what is analytics? Again, analytics, again, the simplest form, it's, it's, it's information resulting from the systematic analysis of data or statistics. And again, if you're using a halftime box score at halftime, you're, you're using analytics. So you can sit here and tell me that you don't believe in it and it's a bunch of crap. But if you ever look at that stat sheet and say, man, we gotta do this or man, we gotta limit this, or we gotta stop this, you're actually using it at its, at its simplest form. And then you ask, why is there a negative perception? And again, it's just a lack of fundamental understanding. And then again, it's more than just mid-range. And then the, the concept, again, I'll talk about it right after this, but the concept of, of accept, ex expected value and shot selection, those are two main kind of broad level analytics ideas. And then why I'm, believable, why I'm a believer. And again, analytical evaluation, again, at, at Columbia, that's my first, really jumped into it and, and saw that it was, it was very important and, and, and some of the advantages you could get. Even as a player, I played at Air Force, there was a Princeton philosophy, layups and threes, open layups and threes. And again, at that time, we were using analytics, no per se, but we were getting high quality shots and we weren't taking a lot of mid range. And then basically there's also a clear cut way to, to gain an advantage over your opponents. And working for Kyle Smith, who's now at Washington State, he always used to say smart wins, smart wins. And here we're just gonna look at uh, expected point value. It's just a breakdown. And again, what is expected point value? It's the numerical summary of all possible values an event can have when it takes place. Basically, a weighted average. So again, this is basically just a chart from, and this is NBA numbers, but you know, again, the game, the game is is universal. But just taking it there, you're looking at the the league averages, zero to three feet. That'd be a paint, you know, a rim shot. You know, shooting at that at 62.8 percent. So that's expected point value of one point, basically 1.3. And then you look at, you know, from three feet to basically the three point line, you're looking basically in the, the 40% or below 40%. Like those are just numbers, like those, those best fact. And so again, your expected point value is basically below, below 0.8. And then you look at the three point line is 1.05. So if you're just looking at this chart, you don't have to know anything about basketball. If I show you this chart and I say, okay, what, what percentage shots, what shots should you be trying to get? And if you're trying to win, obviously you're gonna say, Paint, paint shots and, and open threes. And then we're going to go to the best mid-range scorer of all time, Michael Jordan. And obviously we're watching, everybody's watching the, the, the Bulls deal. And then this is what he was in 96, 97. And this is when he took his most mid-range attempts. And you can see him all the way out here to the right. He took over 1,100 mid-range shots. And you look at the guys, you know, the, the hot podgy guys, and this just was the NBA back then. But you look at the, the mid-range breakdown of, of those guys, like a Grant Hill, Juwan Howard, Glenn Robinson, 
and you see how many attempts they took and their field goal percentage. So this is basically just a breakdown of, of what Jordan shot. And so you see that mid-range area, again, he's 50%. Again, so again, that's just, like that's Michael, the greatest of all time. And again, unless we have arguments here, I don't know. But if you're gonna tell me that, hey, Jordan, oh, the mid-range, man, you got a Jordan, man, Jordan, he, he lived off the mid-range. Yeah, well, here's his, here are his numbers for his most efficient mid-range season. He shot 50% basically from the elbows, and then he shot 49 and 48% from, from the short corners and inside. And so then you look at the paint, he was actually, you know, 96, a little bit older. So he wasn't, he wasn't even a great paint finisher. He was actually better from, from the elbow than he was from the paint. And again, it's just a loss, a little bit of loss of athleticism and obviously, you know, just, just a, a hodgepodge of things, but just getting older. And so then we just do a, a mid-range breakdown. And so we're like, okay, well, in 96, 97, the greatest mid-range shooter of all time shot 49 and a half percent on over 1,100 attempts. Again, that's expected point value of 0.99. And then that'd be the equivalent of shooting 33% from three. So again, just they take the greatest of all time. Again, he took all those attempts. If he was just shot 33% from three, he would have been similarly efficient. And then you think of, okay, the greatest of all time, again, he shot 49 and a half. Now what are college players shooting? They're shooting 37% from, from the mid range. And that's a 0.74 expected point value. And the NCAA three point average is 33%, which is expected 0.99 value. So again, you're just comparing it we're taking the greatest and we're looking at what's being accomplished in college basketball. And you're looking at these numbers and you're like, okay, well, based on that math, if you're saying, you know, people shoot the average, say 37%, if you shot 10% of your shots from mid range and you took 5% less, you projected to win one more game because you're taking out bad shots that are giving you 0.74, which would be dead last in, in offensive efficiency. You took all your shots. And then, yeah, it was assumption that you're shooting the average 37%. And then again, some people have seen these charts, but again, the, the game has changed. It's the NBA obviously, but again, the, it, it's gonna mirror. It always mirrors, it always, you know, it's the league leader in the games. And you look at, again, 0102, and then you look at 1920. And again, you see the threes from the corner, you see paint shots, and then just, just putting it in perspective, Steph Curry made more threes in two seasons than Bird did in his 13 year career. And so you think about, you, you know what I mean? Like you, you think Larry Bird, man, oh, Larry Bird, you'd be like, oh my good. Curry did what he did <laughs> in two seasons as far as three-point makes. And then we think about corner threes. Everybody talks about in the NBA, they're really big. And everybody says, oh, man, corner threes, corner threes. Yes, the corner threes in the NBA, they're making them at a 4% higher rate. And then in college, they're making them at a 2.5% higher rate. And yes, why? Less dribbles. They're mostly catch-and-shoot scenarios. They're uncontested most of the time because they're longer closeouts. And in the NBA, it's the shortest distance. So again, the fun fact, again, 3% more corner threes, and this is from the NBA, that wins one more game a year. 6% more wins two more games a year. The Spurs were the first to utilize it. Then they basically, from 99 to, to 2014, they were kind of the people that were the champions of it. And most people kind of copied them, but they caught on late and it's kind of trickled down. But currently, P.J. Tucker, before the NBA subsided, P.J. Tucker was leading the NBA in, in, in corner threes. And now we're gonna go over just some popular analytics terms. Again, PPP, points per possession, pace and then when people say pace that's that's basically that's just the average possessions per game then we talk about efficiency margin that's your offensive points per possession minus your defensive points per possession and we talked about expected point value we spoke about that turnover percentage offense and re offense and defense offense and defensive rebounding percentage we got free throw rate so often you get to the free throw line based on your shot attempts player efficiency rate i know people have heard that that's basically just giving you a numerical value player rating and then the four factors, you'll hear that. And basically the four factors, just strategic understanding of the game. And so that incorporates shooting, effective field goal percentage. That's 46% of the game. Then turnovers, that's 35% of the game. Rebounding is 12% of the game and free throws, free throw rate is 7% of the game. So again, obviously you see shooting and taking care of the ball are two of the most important things. And it was kind of crazy because that's what Kyle Smith, those were his three things, defend, rebound, take care of the ball. And you think about that, if they're shooting a low percentage, because shooting is the most important thing and you're shooting a high percentage, you're gonna win more games. If you're not turning over the ball and they are, and you're getting more possessions, then again, it gives you a better chance of winning. And then rebounding again, those, those are just went in that order. So we just took the top three most things analytically and we preach that those are the most important things to us. And then you say, okay, it's a lot of information. I know I'm going fast, don't have a lot of time, but you know, where should I start? And again, you can start tracking stats yourself. And again, something that one of the big things uh, as that will affect 
you know, as far as the shooting percentages are the contested shots. And you go contested versus uncontested. So, again, if you want a lower team shooting high percentage against you, again, you can track contested shots, see how many open uncontested looks you're, you're giving up. And then you talk about deflections, again, just messing up teams' rhythm. And then talk about paint touches. It was crazy. Uh, I went back retroactively and, and charted paint touches for, for our team, for UTSA, and, 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 and had just whether we got a paint touch, what was the outcome? And it was just so, so crazy when we got a paint touch how much more points per possession we averaged. And on the flip side, we kept teams out of the paint. Again, their points per possession were, were low as opposed to when they did get a paint, they were high. So, again, if you're going to, you know, say that, then, then that's something that you, sh- you could track, and it, it, does have, it does have relevance. And then uh, you want to say, like, you know, the, the, the basic thing is use rates instead of the totals. And, again, points per possession, there's a formula. If you, I mean, again, if you want the formula, uh, it's pretty easy to do, but you can get this stuff off of a stat sheet. That's why I put all that stuff in there. You can, you can convert your stat sheet to an analytics stat, stat sheet. If anything, you get it half the time. You can go to two-point percentage. You can do that. You can do offense, re- offense and defense rebound percentage, turnover percentage, free throw rate, and then free throw rate is just free throw attempts over field goal attempts. And then uh, have a growth mindset. Again, I'm not telling you to secure all, be all. I'm not telling you you should just go in and just do that, you know, throw it over the blanket. But, again, be open-minded and, and, and use it and, and have it be something that it allows you to get different perspectives. And then I'm just going to talk about just the D1 averages. For, for this past season. Points per possession was 1.02. Again, that's a raw number. You look at a, at a service like Ken Palm, it does, it does basically, uh, it, 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 it's like weighted. They, if you play against a good defensive team, you score 1.02, then that's great. If you play against a crappy team, you score against 1.02, then you get, you, get, you get downgraded a little bit. So again, it's not, this is just the raw points per possession. And then the pace, the average, you know, average possession per game was 69. Three, three point percentage was 33.3. Two point percentage was was 49.4. And again, mid-range was 37, as I said, at the rim was 62. And then effective field goal percentage is 50%, and effective field goal percentage is just, it's weighted towards the three-pointer. Like the three-pointer has more weight than the twos. So it's a true a true measurement. Then the turnover percentage, it was uh, 18.9%, which is basically 13 turnovers per game, and that's on the average of 69 possessions. So then you go offense and defense rebounded percentage, Offense rebounding percentage was 28%, which makes the defense rebounding percentage 72%. Then the free throw rate would have been 32.6, and the three-point rate, and again, how, many, how often we're taking three points, 37.5. So again, that just kind of gives you, gives you a basis and a, and a rubric to kind of see where, where you are. And so again, just, you know, we only had 20 minutes, so I tried to jam everything in there, so I know I threw a lot out there, but uh, that's just, you know, one-on-one. And just kind of getting you, getting you into the culture. Talk real quick, Adam. That great job, by the way. Talk real quick about um, things that you guys use in particular at UTSA that you, whether it's in practice, whether it's halftime, whether it's something that you try to really measure your success on uh, from an analytics standpoint. And then uh, some, some of us on the call may not be familiar with Ken Palm. I don't know. Uh, if you're non-Division One, normally you're not using Ken Palm because you don't have access to it if you're D2 or uh, JUCO or even high school. So talk a little bit about that as well, if you don't mind. Yeah, great question, Brian. Uh, again, for us, we, we really use, we use Ken Palm a lot. And again, and, and I'll go back to the slide, the Division One averages are big for us. So again, we want to measure ourselves. We want to be above average in as many things as we can be. And it's even, again, the Ken Palm gives you a, a, a team rating also. And again, we want to we want to be obviously above average. We want to be top 100. But again, it really gives you kind of an idea where you, where you stack up against the rest of the field. And that's what we just want to be realistic about what we're telling our guys. If I'm telling our guys, hey, you know, we need to, we need to get 10 turnovers per game or less, and our pace is high, in which we are, we're a high paced team. So we need to look at turnover percentage, not just the raw number. Because again, I can hold them to an unrealistic standard. And they may think coming in the locker room feeling bad about it, when in reality, we're usually one of the top 75 teams in, in, in turnover percentage. So again, we want to sell the right message. We want to make sure our guys are, are hearing the right message and it's all based on how you play. And so that, that's something that, that I'd say, you know, to that, and that's kind of how we use it and points per possession. We speak like that. Cause again, we want to, we want to be above one and want the, the opponent to be below one. And we just want to make sure that we're getting the most out of those things and, and we use them, in game, and we have some other things analytically we'll use 
two for ones. Like we always do two for ones. Two for ones actually won us a game against Rice this year. And people looked at us like we were crazy. Rice, Rice went in his own all game. And we made it. We took a shot, a quick shot. We had the ball with about 45 seconds. We come down, run a quick hitter, shoot the ball in five seconds. And we end up getting a layup with about two seconds left because we got two possessions at the end. So then just things like that are how we kind of have analytics in our program and, and, and utilize it. And then my last question before we open it up, it seems like the reason why uh, for co college athletes anyway, or college coaches anyway, the 37% mid-range versus the 33% from three when it's one more point, seems like that's why more teams are going more towards shooting threes and, and inside the paint. Would that, would that be something that you've found in your research too? Yes, it is. And again, these are, these are open threes. I mean, I'm not telling you to chuck up threes off the dribble and there, there is a threshold, you know, and again, 33% is, is, is the average and some people will be below, some people will be, you know, above that. But uh, yes, I, I do believe that. And, and again, we stopped in, at UTSA our first couple of years, we'd, we'd spend time practicing mid-range jump shots. Coach is like, why are we practicing that? We're encouraging it. And we've kind of gone away from shooting it. Obviously, if there's two on the shot clock, yes. You know, you want to shoot a mid-range jumper if you have, you know, you have no other shot to get off. Yes, you want to get off a shot. Because obviously, if you don't shoot a shot, the expected value is zero. You know, so again, we're not going to be idiots about it. But we're going to try to get rhythm shots, practice shots, and hopefully we can get rim, rim twos or, or open threes. Well, let's open it up for a conversation. Coach L, you got anything? Smith? I'm sorry, I was on mute. No, I'm I'm good. I'd like to I'd like to hear. I want to hear some questions, but I I will fire a few at some guys I see here on about analytics because I think some of their programs uh, do use analytics, and so I'd love to hear some of the things that they have to say. But uh, I thought some of that stuff was great. Um, Tim Fields, Boo Williams, West Mac High School, also John Lucas Trainer. Question: When you look at the analytics, they're actually doing breakdown of threes. Um, Catch and shoot threes versus off the dribble threes. Did I oh look yeah, at the breakdown for sure. And we use that in our program. Uh, there's there's basically we just go by assisted threes versus not assisted, non not assisted threes. So basically that is threes off the dribble. But again, I only have the breakdown basically of our team on that. And we take a guy like one of our best three point shooters. You know what I mean when he when it's a catch and shoot three, he's shooting. 40, 43% when it's off the dribble, he's shooting 30, 30, 31, 31 and a half. Wow. You know what I mean? Like, so again, that's just, that's within our program. Again, I don't have the numbers of, of everybody else, but I just, I do know our team and obviously our goal is to get them more catch and shoot threes then <laughs> and stop them off the dribble. Obviously the shot clock's running down, you're going to have to shoot some, but again, you got to be very, very gifted to, to be making threes off the dribble like that at that high of a rate. And even 33%, that's not bad. It's not awful for nah. average 33. It is a big drop off from, from 40 plus though. Yes, it is. And so again, we, we try to preach that and obviously the less dribbles, the more rhythm, rhythm shots you can get, the better. And even from mid range, if you're shooting a, a, a mid range shot that's not off the dribble, your percentages are obviously going to be higher. Adam, Tommy Strine over at Lamar. How you doing, man? Hey, doing good. How are you? I'm good, man. Hey, so can you talk, how does this, uh, how's this, with your ball screen coverages defensively? Do you guys use this with that kind of stuff? And you're dropping your center to force more, you're going over the top of screens to force, you know, 10 to those 10 to 15 footers. Are you, are you guys using this for that kind of stuff? Or is it more so based on, you know, hey, this guy's, you know, we're going under because this guy just can't shoot threes and we'll, we'll adjust from there. Are you always, always using this for that type of stuff? Uh, it can be, again, it, it, it's a great question. It, it depends. And again, we, we try to encourage guys that don't, make shots and again we, we have information and there are a lot of websites out there that can give you information on mid mid-range jump shots and some people are bad finishers so again we want them to try to finish at the rim because they're bad finishers so again we, we kind of it kind of goes you know based on personnel but we do have that information and know what their strong points are and we try to keep them away from those strong points so some people we may trap to get the ball out of their hands some people we may drop and encourage them to shoot floaters and some people will shoot mid-range shots with a rear view contest and the guys that do shoot them we do want them to shoot them <laughs> so we will bait them in and that's based from film film review and, and knowing our opponents and, and guys that don't heavily preach analytics, they, they will, they will get baited into them. But we basically will have three different ball screen coverages and we choose accordingly based on what their strong points are. 
Awesome. Thank you. Adam. Adam, what's up, man? It's Trey from Penn. Hey, what's happening, man? Chilling, man. Uh, you know, I know you have a similar concept of, of, of catch and shoot threes and everything like that, being with your familiarity with the Ivy League, um, as well as with Princeton stuff. I was at Sanford with Jimmy Toledo, who was a big Princeton guy, so I know exactly what you're talking about. But um, I just wanted to ask, just personally, um, with the line changes this year, we've noticed that uh, particularly guys were struggling to shoot at certain times with the, the moving back of the line. Um, how did that affect you guys analytically as far as a team from whether or not you were shooting things or certain concepts that you were, you were trying to run or what, you know, what have you? I, I got you. Well, yeah, well, luckily again, in our recruiting, we recruited guys that don't shoot on the line. And that's something that I look for when I'm recruiting a high school kid is he's shooting his threes right on the line. Cause if he is shooting them right on the line, most of the time it's going to be a struggle to get him to move back to shoot that thing further, you know? And so the numbers from the line change, it was the, the division one average the year prior before the line change was 35% from three. So basically it's, it's only, and I say only, been a 2% difference, which is huge, you know, across the grand scheme. You know, we're talking about 351 or 353 Division One teams. But it, it hasn't, it, it's been a slow, you know, it's kind of affected certain teams and it hadn't affected us, us much because we let our guys, they shoot it from the volleyball line. So, it doesn't, so it's not, not as much so us, our high volume shooters, they shoot it from deep anyway. And, so and make it, and make it. Yeah, I know. So if for us personally, for UTSA, it wasn't as concerning. But we did have some guys who, who used to practice their threes on the line and they struggled to shoot it this year because again, just the, the muscle memory and they were only calibrated to shoot that, you know, that old college three. Gotcha, man. Appreciate it. Yep. No problem. Adam. Hey, what's happening? What's hey, going on, Mike? Man? Mike Scott, uh, Cal State Bakersfield. Um, I got a, like a two part question. One, um, I, I haven't really got big into analytics. So can you talk a little bit about, um, you talked a little bit about the rated compared to the weighted totals and what, what, which do y'all use that for? And then the second part of the question was, when do you find your balance of using analytics compared to, uh, I guess your players or your team? Like, is it better to, man, I'm gonna just go analytics for my offense and you know, tailor away a little bit for defense. Uh, just kind of the balance of using analytics compared to uh, whichever team you have. I got you. No, good question, Mike. Uh, as far as just the weighted, uh, as far as like Ken Palm is concerned, and that's what I was talking yeah. about, Ken Palm. Mm -hmm. We will use the we'll use the, the the rated ones because again, that's that's uh, basically going strength of schedule and basically the 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 opponent does does dictate how good you're going to be. And also the possessions. You know, what I mean, if you play against a slow team, it's going to be more methodical. It's going to be a slower-paced game. If it's if it gets a team that you know, if it's a if we bought an opponent and we, you know, again, Ken Palm also tells you how much you're supposed to win the game by analytically. So again, it kind of gives you, you know, just a viewpoint. Okay, we should be beating this team by ten points if we're as good as the numbers say we are. Mm -hmm. You know, again, so it's kind of like you know, some like some you know, ugly wins, unquote. And again, you want to find room to grow and you want to find room to to, to improve. And obviously, you want the win. We never we never give those back. But we want to make sure that we're performing at the level that we should be against like-minded competition. I'll just say, for instance, we played Illinois State out of conference this year. They would have been slightly below the average Conference USA team. So we had them at home this year. So if we're not beating them, we should be cause for concern because they'd be basically a slightly below the average Conference USA team at home. So again, so that, that's kind of, kind of the deal. We should be winning that game by 10 points, you know, just in theory. And so, again, we'll, we'll get on our guys like, hey, we won that game, but we could have played better, and this is why. <clears throat> and, again, we use the numbers to, to kind of talk about that. And as far as finding a balance, again, I, I'm more toward the numbers, to be honest with me personally, because, again, I like to take the, the, the subjectivity out of it and make it objective, you know, meet these numerical numbers. Like, are, am I a good three-point shooter? Well, are you shooting 33%? You know what I mean? Like that's, that's, the, yeah. that's the average. Yeah. So if yeah. you're below that, you're a below average three-point shooter. I don't care what you're telling me and how much you get in the gym. You might need to get in the gym more because, again, you're not performing up to the standards that are required to be, you know, to be elite. So, again, I, I, I say the numbers tell a story. Obviously, you have to know what that story is telling. Hey, Adam. It's Chris over hey, in North that? Texas. Yeah, um, how you doing? I got a couple questions. One, uh, this is a three-part question probably, but first, did, uh, did Coach Smith consult you in 2017 when we were playing in the CBI championship um, for some scouting uh, information? Secondly, being a Kyle Smith guy, do you believe in 
kind of his concept of how he um, kind of orchestrates playing time behind his practice uh, practice measurement um, tool, I guess you can call it, whatever you want to call it. But um, yeah, you can, you can go with that. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, he definitely did call me on that. No, it didn't work. You guys, you guys, <laughs> you guys beat him. But again, I mean, again, obviously North Texas is a great program, done a great job. Uh, I don't know if you guys lose analytics or not, but you guys are really good. But uh, I, I, I do think that there's value in that because again, it's it's uh, Kyle Smith is holding people to a standard every day, and again, it's it's a it's the concept of basically maxing out who you are, and everyone's not the same, and so everyone's ceiling is different. So again, if I'm asking you, like, again, we have to be realistic with our expectations. If you shot 20% from three the year before, it's highly unlikely you're going to come and shoot 40 the next year. So I need to, I need to have something, you know, a plan or something that, you know, that can kind of get you along for player development. And I think it's really huge on, on that. And, and you can kind of sculpt things into the way you want your team to value. Because when you put those metrics up there, you can have things that are weighted. You know, and in the same way, like he had live ball turnovers were less weighted than dead ball turnovers. But in right. game, I transitioned the hardest thing to guard. So if you're turning the ball over, I'm throwing the ball to the other team and they're fast breaking against us, a little bit harder to guard them, you know, no matter how good of how good my set defense is. So I, I think it is value in it. You have to be fully committed to it. You need a full staff that's that's dedicated to it. And I know Coach Hubby, who will speak later on, they, they've carried it along with them. And some programs believe in 100%. I'm not mm-hmm. saying we believe in 100%, but we use it uh, to our abilities and, and, and things that will help us gain an advantage any way we can. Cool. Appreciate it. Yep, no problem. Hey, Adam, I want to jump on real quick, man. What's going on? Hey, how you doing, Jair? I'm, I'm good, man. From, the, from a defensive perspective, you know, I, I know a lot of people with analytics, they, they think of it from the offensive you know, perspective. But defensively, what ways did you guys use it and what were the most effective – things you use to kind of sell your guys on defensive points? Honestly, defensively, the, the things we really focused on were pace. Again, and I use this, I do our scheduling, so I kind of use this in scheduling. Uh, teams that struggle to score, you know, it can depend on how they're scoring. We, we look at what percentage of their shots they shoot, you know, how many rim twos do they shoot, what percentage of that, what percentage of mid-range jumpers do they shoot, what percentage of threes do they shoot. And based on that information, we may switch more to give them less, you know, less opportunity. We want to make them go one-on-one. A team like Louisiana Tech, and I'm, hopefully no one's on this call, but they're a high assist team. So we want to switch. We want to make them go one-on-one because they share the ball really well. So we're not going to let them sit there and come off the corner, you know, whatever guy drives, strong side corner. We're not, we're not leaving that because that's what they want. They want you to bite and they want you to, to shoot those shots. So, again, we use it more based on personnel, you know, and what guys do and what they want to do and, 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 and go from there. And – and rebounding is really big, too, because, again, we play fast. So if you look at the raw rebounding numbers, it looks really good because we can lead the league in total rebounds. But if we're the <laughs> fastest based team, we're going to have more opportunities to get the rebounds. So, again, when you use those raw numbers of, as total rebounds and, and you use, you know, total turnovers, we're never going to be the lowest turnover team either because we're always going to be one of the fastest. So, again, we use it kind of just the, the turnover percentage. They turn the ball over. Maybe we can, sh- maybe we can shake them up a little bit. And how, what is their assist rate? How are they getting to the free throw line? Are they in some teams just like to get fouled? Like they're not trying to make the shots. Hey guy, you got to go straight up, man. They thrive off getting to the line. Like they need, he needs this to score. So we're going to allow that guy to shoot that contested layup. If he makes it, he makes it. And ball screen coverage is again, if guys shoot mid range, we're going to drop back our center, let them shoot the mid range, but make sure we get at least a rear view contest on the ball handler. So again, we, we, we kind of, we kind of market that way defensively and then transition, you know what I mean? And they get out and they run, you know, and, 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 and things of that, that nature. So it, it's, it definitely is used defensively as much as offensively. And we look at what they're good at and what they're bad at. And if they're a bad three-point shooting team, then obviously we're going to give them more threes. And I think anybody would do that. We'll take uh, two more questions for Adam. Hey, Adam, uh, Jalen Little here. Hey, what's happening? Man, can you speak a little bit on the subjective versus the, you know, objective, you know, evaluations you guys use in recruiting or with your own players? Yes, and again, it, and it's really something that, that Kyle Smith did and being subjective is, again, it's my guy, so I'm looking at my guy. I recruited this guy. I looked at what he, you know, what he does well, and, and we have to, again, our job is construct the team that's going to be the most competitive. So, again, if we're struggling shooting the ball, a guy that shooting threes may get more run than a guy who may be better, unquote, on paper, but it's kind of what we need in our roles. So, again, it's more so of 
in my opinion, is, is, is taking what the team needs. Like if we're struggling rebounding, then I might play the rebounder instead of the stretch four. Maybe we need two bigs. And we've done that. We've adjusted our lineups to the teams that we're playing at times and to, to, to basically to match their strengths. If we can keep them, we give up two less, three less offensive rebounds. That gives us a better chance to win. You have to understand that. This is not about me not liking you. This is about the numbers. We are struggling to rebound. They rebound. We got it. We have to be able to combat that and confront that. So again, it's more of a overall view of what the numbers are telling us we need to account for, as opposed to just saying, hey, you're better than him in my eye, so I'm going to play him because he, I think that he's better, as opposed to what the team needs to be successful. We're just trying to win that game. Right. That's all. That's the most important game. The next one, that's the game we're trying to win. If it's rebounding that night, it's rebounding. If it's blocking shots, we'll play our shot blocker. If it's, you know, we got to get out and run. If we got to switch four, we got to play small ball, we'll play small ball. So, again, it's, it's more so of, of that concept of being, of being objective, like, okay, these are the numbers. This is what they're saying. This is when we need to stop, as opposed to I just feel like he's a better player. I'm going to play him. How, just to follow up on his question, how would you use that in recruiting too? Did you guys use that a lot in recruiting as far as that same kind of approach? Yeah, yes, we did. And again, obviously there's a, there's a premium on shooting right now. Like again, if you see the guys in there to transfer poor up, they're shooting the ball well, they're getting, I mean, it's unbelievable some of the, some of the traction that they're getting. So again, we do value shooting. We have value skill over athleticism and conference USA that's not very popular. Uh, Cause you look at teams that have been successful, like North Texas is a very athletic team, but this year they shot the three ball better than they ever had. It was a record-breaking three-point team. And, oh, oh, lo and behold, they won Conference USA this year. You know, so, again, you know, it, it's, it's kind of crazy to say that, you know, things have shifted that way. And some of the teams that haven't not shot the ball very well haven't had as much success as of late. Now, teams like, like Texas Tech that lock you down, you know, then, yeah, if you're not scoring, it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's, it's just a different thought. And we've just kind of gone, in my opinion, just at, at times, skill over athleticism. And, I mean, if you want to talk about analytics, again, they, they give them the shoe circuit – Gives that, you know, gives you a whole bunch of information on that. And again, the two most important things that we found were that were translatable were, were which is crazy. It's just playing time and usage rate, which is, which is unbelievable. If you think about it, though, if I'm an AAU coach, if I'm playing you a lot, that means unless it's daddy ball. I mean, I'm that, that gets thrown out of the window. But again, you just think, okay, if he's playing him a lot, he must have shown something that means he's pretty good. Usage rate means I'm basing winning, wins and losses off you trying to make plays, whether you're scoring, whether you're assisting, whether you're turning over the ball. So again, those two things were the, were the things that showed up the most that showed that a player was going to be pretty good in college or had a chance to be good. Obviously, there are a lot of other factors, but those are kind of things we look for. If I'm just looking at a raw, I've never seen a kid play, okay, how much does he play? How much is the coach allowing him to try to make plays? And that's something that I can get from the people that do the advanced stats in Nike, Under Armour, and Adidas. Bill, we'll take one more. I have a time and score question for you, Adam. Coach Mangrum here at Troy. Yeah, what's happening? Now you got those two studs that really <laughs> shoot the ball well, time and score into the game. From using analytics, one, one, neither guy's shooting the ball well, but you know, one of them you want to have the ball, but you had a third guy that may have had a solid game. Are you guys using analytics to go to that? Your guys that you know normally get it done? Or are you going to use the guy at that for that particular game that showed that he's having a successful game? Oh man, great question, great question. Uh, again, it's me personally, and I don't I don't call timeouts, so again, I'm just going to make my suggestions to the head coach. Mm -hmm. But if he were to come to me, I'd go with the guy that that's that's comfortable in that position. Because again, even though someone may have had a great game during that crunch time, again, sometimes and people say it. You know, I mean, the numbers are the numbers, but that's over time. And that's what people don't realize. Like this, this is a, this is like, again, if we were going to flip a coin, I told you, you know what? I'm going to give you $10 every time it hits tails and I'm going to take a dollar every time it hits heads. Like, would you take mm -hmm. that bet? Yeah, of course you would. Right. Because over time <laughs> it might land heads the first four times or might tails and I'm getting $4. As soon as it's heads, you get 20. You know what I mean? Like all that stuff doesn't matter. You know what I mean? So again, I think the law of average. So again, we usually go with a guy who over time has been more productive for us. If that makes sense. So, yes, we're going to go with one of our studs to shoot, to shoot the last shot. We're not going to go away from even though that game, per se, we're going over the body of work, not just the finite point. Good, good. Thanks, Coach Hood. We're going to shift uh, to your partner, former partner in crime. Hey, Coach uh, Burton, can I, can I jump in for a second? Yeah, please, please, please. I, I would love to hear. We, we've got Marty Wilson on the, on the line uh, from Cal. 
Uh, Marty's a longtime West Coast guy, been a head coach at, at Pepperdine, and now is over at Cal with Coach Fox. And I'd love to hear, you know, some of his thoughts. If, if he's used analytics when he was at Pepperdine, or um, are they currently using analytics in, in, in what fashion they're using it at Cal? Well, I tell you what, I'm uh, I'm 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 more of the the old school. Uh, I got a chuckle out of the uh, the intro with Charles and, and Kenny. Um, kind of the eyes for me. This is me selfishly. The eyes tell me what what matters. Um, uh, kind of like what you said, Adam. Towards the end, you're gonna go with a guy who's been in a situation, a guy you can trust. A guy who's got the experience, a guy who has the know-how and the and the confidence. Uh, we have <clears throat> we have a guy like that, Matt Bradley. Uh, late time and again, his, his numbers and sure. analytics are high. This is uh, uh, coach um, for Cal. But but he has he has the 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 heart to be able to do those things and the confidence to do those things. So Lamont, asking answering your your, your first question. I didn't do a whole lot in terms of points per possession, uh, offensive uh, efficiency rating and things like that, uh, because I've never really studied it. Um, I was going to shoot uh, Adam a, a, an, an email and ask him for the slides and maybe have a chance to, to, to dig into it a little bit more. Um, I was just straight, basic, uh, what are they shooting? What are we shooting? How many turnovers? I mean, just the basic things that I thought um, went to, to winning and losing. Coach Fox has dug into it a lot more. He spent more time working with uh, some, some NBA guys. Uh, Jeff M. Gunn, he's a good friend of his. Uh, he spent some time with the Milwaukee Bucks. So he's dug, in it, he's dug into it a lot more. But although this past year, we didn't spend a whole lot of time talking about it, working on it, because we were trying to, we're trying to survive. Um, we've talked about it, and obviously this pandemic has put us back on some things, but we've talked about getting better at it, studying it more, and now we have some guys returning where you have that body of work and be able to, to manipulate um, and run some plays and under, understand who's capable of doing what. Um, so I think we will dig into it more, and I'll learn more and uh, I'll, I'll become better at it. But I have not been uh, personally a, a big analytics guy. It's, it's about, hey, can this guy do this better than what that guy can do? Burton, and I, I, great, great answer, Coach. Uh, honest and, and, and what have you. I have a question for Adam based off that. Um, I kind of based myself a little bit like Marty. I had a chance to play for Marty at San Diego and great coach and great competitor and was a hell of a player. Do you find that maybe, you know, so to say the old school coaches have a hard time with the analytics as part as more based than like maybe the newer school coaches like uh, the younger guys like Todd Golden at San Francisco and and uh, and maybe even yourself being a younger guy? Yeah, it normally is. And, and it's always again, that's why I try to use Jordan, you know, because you know, people have, have watched the last dance and they'll come back and say, oh, man, see, look, 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 you know. And then, again, I just want to break down the numbers. And I'm not saying that, obviously, you're trying to win games. Whatever works for you at the end of the day is, is awesome. I just want to give myself the best chance to win. And that's it. You know, and, and, these, and with the numbers, again, it's, it's an objective measure. It's not just me saying, oh, I feel like this. I feel like that. It's, you know what, like, this guy's offensive rating is this. So I can compare a season, like Javon Jackson, who I lead in score, he had a way better season this year than he did last year. And people will look at it and say, oh, man, just because he was a second lead scorer in the nation. No, his efficiency jumped six and a half points. That's why he was, that's why he was, he was an amazing season. It wasn't because he just averaged those points. He, the, the, the rate, his usage rate, his efficiency were off the charts. You know, and that's why he had a good season. And I can tell him that, and I can show him that, not just saying, hey, you, you average 28 points a game. But he was way more efficient this year than he was last year. But he limited some of those tough twos that he took. I was like, if you're going to take it, just make it. I don't care. Like, if you're going to make it, then that's two points. If you're going to miss it, you're going to shoot it at 37%. So he upped those little things. And, and I agree, though. It, it, is, it is a little bit of disparity. But, again, if you just think, and I'm not I'm saying, just be open-minded. You don't have to take it, you know, all the way down the throat. Just be open-minded. No doubt. No doubt. And I love the fact that you obviously can back things up with numbers. Um, when you can do that and hold guys accountable to that and show them, I think that uh, 
that helps uh, tremendously when you're trying to sell it to your team and so on and so forth. But uh, awesome, awesome presentation. We appreciate you. We appreciate all the questions. And we're going to let Coach Burton jump in here and introduce uh, our next speaker, and we'll roll from there. Yeah, we'll get straight to it. Associate Head Coach, San Francisco. Um, he's had a great amount of success in his career. San Francisco is one of the better teams in that league and is still on the rise. Uh, look forward to hearing what he has to say. Uh, Coach, Coach Hubdy, lead the way. All right, guys. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Um, yeah. Um, all right, can you guys see that? We yes. Get yes. Yep. All right, yeah, just real quick. I thought um, th those are some great questions that all you guys are asking. I really got a lot out of that, especially that last 20 minutes. Um, so I want to get to the questions as fast as, as, fast as I can here because um, I think that's really, really valuable. And when I was thinking about doing this, just a little bit of background. Um, I know Kyle Smith was mentioned a couple times in that. And uh, I, I worked for Kyle for eight years. So I got up to Columbia uh, in 2011 um, and worked for him for five years there and then three years at San Francisco. And then uh, last year when he went up to Washington State, stayed at San Francisco. And we, we've been doing a lot of the same things. And we use analytics in probably every part of our program, probably too much, honestly. And what I'd like to do is kind of go over just every way that we use it very generally. And then if you guys, if anything catches your eye and you have questions on, on any of this stuff that I'll talk about at the beginning, we can, we can go over that um, when, when you guys ask questions. And then I'll dive into our hustle stats, which is really the heartbeat of our program. And I know some of you um, kind of know, probably know what that is a little bit, and it might be new for some of you, but I think it's, it's a really valuable thing and uh, especially for, for coaches that want to start to track things in practice. So um, in my opinion, and um, again, I think there, there's, there's a difference um, in the, the nine years that I've been coaching that I've, I've really been kind of in the trenches on this stuff. I think there's kind of two ways to look at analytics. And the first is analyzing data that's available to anyone that wants to, you know, pay a fee for a website or um, uh, put, basically pay for something that uh, uh, outside source that will, will give information about your team. And then there's collecting, which is like what you personally, your staff is doing every day in practice and games. Um, and I think there, there's different, there's a difference there. So analysis, as I said, this is stuff that I think is available to everyone. Um, and an example is like Ken Palm, which we talked about, which obviously you need to pay a fee to get a subscription for that. And I think there's a ton of value in that because not only can you evaluate your own team, but you're, you're going to have information on every other uh, D1 team. So for like scouting, scheduling, and uh, and recruiting, these can, or scouting and scheduling, can 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 palm can be very valuable. And then there's other um, there's some other websites and uh, some some other things that you can you can also purchase that can be even more valuable in recruiting. Um, so here's just the four things that we use the most at San Francisco. Ken Palm for sure. That's the number one thing. And then Open Look to Analytics is another, is a company that, that we basically use. Um, we outsource our, uh, our box scores and our play-by-plays to them. And then they basically send us back uh, advanced plus minus data on our team. And they also provide data for like all the shoe companies, uh, AU circuits, so Nike, Adidas, and Under Armour. Um, so it can be used in recruiting as well. And again, these are things if you guys have questions on any of these things, just, just take a note and I can answer that at the end. And then Hoop Lens um, is similar to Ken Palm, but it's, it's just plus minus data. So it's, it's plus minus data for all 351 D or 352 D1 teams. Um, and then Hoop Math is more like tempo and shot selection data. So that gets into, you know, percentage of shots as threes, mid-range, um, what percentage of their shots – comes in transition and again that's available for all teams um, so those are things that you could you could use right now if, if you want to and um, and, st and start to look at as a way to kind of get started and then collecting as I said I think this is this is different this is this is more tracked by your own staff members so it's what more what you value as a, as a staff and like I think a lot of programs are probably tracking like defensive stats like deflections or how many times a guy dives on the floor um, and that's really where our, our hustle sets started. Um, and I think the value in, in doing this is, is just, I, I kind of listed some, some things here. 
Um, these, this, it can be a great leadership tool within your program of seeing just where, uh, where your players stand in the things that matter to you as coaches. Um, and then obviously it, you can address how to improve in certain areas just statistically and you really using it as a coaching tool. Um, you know, so you can say, you can bring in a guy and say, Hey, you're only, your, your block out to miss block out ratio isn't good enough. You need to try to improve that. And then you can kind of track that and see where they can make improvements um, statistically. And then I think for us, why we love it is it creates a meritocracy where just everyone can see where they stand. And that's, that goes back to the leadership part of it. Um, but I think it's, it's really, really valuable. And, and I'll get into um, exactly how we use it here in a second. And then it holds coaches accountable too. And like Adam was talking about recruiting a little bit. And, and just to be clear, not, none of this matters if, if you don't recruit good players, obviously. I think we all know that, but the analytical piece is really trying to get the most out of guys and just trying to gain those small incremental advantages wherever you can. I think that's where it's most valuable, but you got to be able to recruit and you got to be able to get good players. Um, that's, that's the number one thing. Um, and then, whoops. Um, and then this is, these are the three areas where we use the data collection. And again, that's specific to our program. Um, these are things that we track with our coaching staff and, our hustle stats are, are 50 different stats that, um, you know, Kyle Smith has kind of made it famous, but him, him and Randy Bennett used it as a way to, to build up the same marriage program. And it was actually, I think, started at, at San Diego when Lamont was a player um, back in 1997. I've heard that pitch a few times. Um, and then possession quality is something, again, and you guys can, I'll talk about the hustle stats. And then if anybody wants to ask questions about possession quality is something that I do personally. Um, and it's just an offensive um, tracking system that I use to track just our half court possession. So it takes transition out of it. So only really possessions that are five on five and trying to get the most out of those possessions. And then we track all our shooting for our guys in, in drills and, uh, and in practice. And we just keep their numbers so they can see where they're improving over the course of their careers, try to give them goals um, and where they can see their averages. So again, that was a lot. And, and again, I, I went through it pretty quickly there um, but if anybody has any questions or we can go back at the end as well and, and review some of that stuff but I did want to talk for about five ten minutes about our, our hustle stats which are really our, our bread and butter and, and some of you might be familiar some of you might not be but what we do is we track every five on five possession in practice as a staff um, and we basically uh, grade our players out on 50 different statistical categories that we think matter um, so these things have been developed over time and have changed over time, but basically there's five different areas that we track. Um, and like shooting and scoring is, is, are things that are pretty, you know, that most people are obviously like made two pointers, made three pointers. We do differentiate between threes, mid range and, and rim twos as well in that category. And I'll show you all the stats in a second here. And then, uh, rebounding is another very important part of a, um, very important section. And those are things like just like blockouts, missed blockouts, tips, uh, going after the ball hard, those things. And then uh, ball handling, we really break down. I think it's a good way to, for people to understand it. We have like four or five different passing stats that we, that we track. Um, so really trying to quantify feel, which, um, you know, is always a big argument against analytics is like you can't quantify feel. We, we try to do that. Um, and then hustle and defense are just, you know, hustle plays, you know, keeping your guy in front, diving on the floor, uh, things like that, and then defensive errors, you know, pretty self-explanatory, not being in the right spot, getting driven around. So we use this, and then each stat has a value. All 50 stats um, have a numerical value, and we track it for every practice and every game in five-on-five -five situations. And then uh, every player gets basically an efficiency rating based on how they're doing in these, in these stats. So it's, it can be information overload. Um, it, it's a lot. I'll click to the next slide here. Here's, here's all the stats that we use. Um, I don't have the values up here. We don't like to give away the, the, the values, but um, just so you can see, like if you just focus on ball handling here, um, and I mentioned like we keep track of, of, a sit, of three different kinds of assists. So like we have actual assists. So if you throw it to a player and he makes a shot, you get an assist, which in our, in our metrics is worth plus four, which is an arbitrary number. Um, that doesn't really mean much, but it means some to us. And then a virtual assist would be like if you drive and drop it off to your big and he goes up and misses a dunk. 
you would still get the same amount of credit for that in our system in practice and in games. And then obviously assist to foul is the same thing. If you, if you drop it to a guy and he goes up and gets fouled, you get credit for that. And then these are other passing stats. Paint touch is a really, really important one um, that we keep track of. Just guys that can get in the paint and make plays and then throwing the ball in the post um, is another one. Just get rewarding guys in a small way for throwing the ball in the post. And then like good screens, good cuts. Anytime that happens, you get a little positive plus one. So it's rewarding the guys that are doing the little things right that don't take talent. Um, and that's the best way to understand it. And I can go back to this. I don't want to go through every stat. Now I can go back to this slide. Um, but uh, the rebounding is a good way to understand it as well. And here's our defense. Like these are positive plays. And then under here is the negative defensive, uh, defensive plays. And then this is, this is what it looks like when we give it back to the guys every day. Um, and it's just, it's just like a leaderboard. So it's like our own personal box score. And like if we practice on a Saturday, we'll, we'll stat this out. Um, as coaches, we'll stat it out. Um, and then this will be posted in the locker room, you know, by Monday morning. So they can see where they did the, based on the previous practice. And then they can see where they, where they are, uh, you know, collectively um, based on like other averages from all the practices. Okay. So we also post that. All right. So um, I'm going to keep this up. That's all, that's all I had. And I, again, I wanted to kind of get through it quickly because I wanted to get to the, the question. I think you can learn the most out of, um, out of just asking questions and, and me kind of going over things. So. Um, let's open it up. Awesome job, Kev. Awesome job. Yeah, let's go straight to questions. Anybody want to shoot first? I'll jump, I'll jump in. Um, you know, first I want to say, you know, we talked about this through a couple of Zooms in the past. You know, if you have a small staff, um, this is a bear. It, it takes time. Um, and it takes, you have to be committed to, 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 to charting these stuff, things in regards to the hustle stats. But again, I think it's, it's what you value. Um, you know, we talked about the vocabulary sheet early on for offense and guy said, well, Hey, you know what? My team is, isn't that smart. And, you know, personally for me, I, I think that's a cop out a little bit because, uh, you know, guys are smarter than you think. And if you, if you value it, they'll, they'll figure it out. And so, um, you know, again, if you're going to jump into this, you know, you got to understand that, you know, it's, it's a beast in terms of keeping up all these numbers and, and what have you. But I'll tell you this, when I was at San Diego, uh, and I'm a hustle stat, I came from the, all those guys that, that lineage that, that do the hustle stats, and we didn't do it in year one and two. And we finished 10th, and we finished ninth. And then I, I decided, hey, you know what, I, I want to do it in, in uh, our third year. And obviously, our players were a little older and were better. But we only did it on the defensive side of the ball because, again, you guys have, have known we uh, – when I talked to you about the defensive stuff in a couple of Zooms before, and we got good. And it was, it was absolutely what Kevin said, that, one, we held everybody accountable. I think that the other guys on the team could see where other guys stood. It took out all the, well, hey, coach is playing this guy because of this. It was like, no, 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 man. Hey, this guy rated number one, so therefore he's going to start in our first exhibition game. And ironically enough, all of those guys who rated high were our best players, you know, those or the guys who helped us win the most. And so um, after the year, our guys, you know, came back to us that had been in the program and were like, hey, coach, we, we love that. You know, that was that was great because it held everybody accountable. And it also it also uh, was a huge deal for leadership in our locker room. You know, older guys getting on younger guys. Hey, man, you, you got too many missed, missed blockouts, man. You got to put you got to put bodies on guys. And it wasn't like, well, what do you mean? No, no, wait, hey, man, look at the board right there. And so I think it's a tremendous, tremendous tool if you're vested in it and you, and you want to do it the right way. Hey, hey, Lamont, this is Marty. You I'm with you. All right. Hey, Kevin, that was, that was big time. Uh, but I, I got a question for both of you guys because I did something similar uh, at Pepperdine. And obviously, Kevin, yours, just looking at the – <clears throat> the grid, I I can't see, I'm old, don't have my glasses on. Um, but it's a lot more detailed than, than what we did. Do, do you think that your, your grid is, is balanced based on the, the variety of positions? Obviously, a guy who's your great scorer and he's low pose, and, and depending on what the, what the, uh, the, the, stat value is so a guy who can score all day inside he's going to get 
more opportunity versus a guy who doesn't shoot as much or versus yeah. a guy who doesn't handle and create? Did you, did, did you guys feel that it, it was balanced out where each guy had the opportunity to, to climb the ladder? Yep. So that's a great question. And the way we, we address that is we break it down by position. And one thing I didn't mention with our hustle stats is we are really heavy on it um, in the fall. So when we start practice October 1, really that, those 30 practices, you know, where, where we're playing a lot in practice, um, that's where it, it's the most valuable and guys are competing for jobs. And we will, what we'll do in the beginning is we'll break it down like, all right, these six guys are competing for the two guard spots. These six guys are competing for the two forward spots. These three guys are competing for center. And then if you win your position, you get to start in the first scrimmage, regardless of, you know, if you're a senior and all league guy, you know, you could, you could get beat out by, by a guy coming in, which most of the time doesn't happen, obviously, because you have a huge advantage just under understanding the system and playing in it year to year. Um, but yeah, that we do address that because the bigger guys uh, will score better um, efficiency wise, just because the rebounding is really, really important. So those guys get, you know, are getting credit for grabbing the ball, but they're also getting credit for, um, you know, blocking out every time, getting two feet in the paint. Um, so they, they, it does get skewed a little bit that way um, with the bigger guys doing better. And I'll jump into Marty. Exactly. Obviously we come from the come, same tree. Uh, we did the same thing. It, it, but what, one thing we did, though, is we got the guys in the locker room and we, had, we said, hey, here are the guards. Here, are the, you know, so there was no confusion on where you stood and who you were. And uh, it, was, it was pretty cut and dry. And so, again, I thought our guys really, really did a good job with it and, and, uh, and uh, you know, it benefited us. The other thing that we did, too, in regards to when we, when you, you know, you have to break down the tape. And, it, again, it's a bear. Kevin can, Kevin can attest to it. And I'm sure Adam, I don't know if they do it at UTSA, but we tried to keep the same eyeballs on the same things. Yeah. So if, if Kevin was doing offense, you know, he was doing offense. If I was doing missed blockouts and, you know, um, uh, guys who didn't go to the offensive glass, we just kept it consistent. So it, w it wasn't like, well, hey, is his version of a missed blockout the same as my version of a missed blockout, if that makes any sense for you? Yeah, definitely. That's, that's an important piece of it. And the, the process for this is, like, obviously you have to film practice. And so, like, we'll go in and we'll, we'll watch our five-on-five -five possessions, whether that could be a scrimmage or it could be, like, half court. Um, and we, we basically – we keep track of the total number of possessions. That's obviously very important for each player. And we normally – we'll have our managers do that, and we'll, we'll have them do that live in practice. And for us, a possession is just anytime you cross half court, okay? So we'll have that. And then after practice, we come in as a staff, watch it together, and then one assistant will do offense, one assistant will do defense, one assistant will do rebounding off the film and normally like say if we play for an hour it probably takes us about an hour and a half to two hours to stat it out so it's it's a it is a huge time commitment um the way we do it but you know again I think this is obviously the I I think this is the extreme you know like I was like I played at Richmond I played on really good teams the best teams I've ever been a part of were the teams that I was on at Richmond and we weren't doing anything like this when I was a player you know it was kind of the opposite and then when I got to Columbia and started coaching under Kyle, it was like, it was like a complete 180. And I, I really liked it and I, I still do. But I think like if, if you're looking to just kind of start out or maybe you're somebody who is already tracking some things in practice, like you could pick, you know, eight things that you want to track and, and kind of get it going. Um, and then over time, maybe add, or maybe you don't think you need to, but um, it's just that obviously what we're doing is, is really extreme. Hey, Kevin, uh, you kind of answered my question, actually you and Lamont both, but I was going to, and I accidentally, I, just, I sent this practice by the numbers thing. I was kind of prematurely sent it, but um, it was when you were talking about the fall and how important that time is. And this is something that kind of I felt um, convicted to count um, last couple of weeks ago. And so I was just like curious, I was like, how much time do we actually have, you know, before our first game in the off season? And um, I'll, get, I'll get to my question. I guess I just sent this, so I have to explain it because uh, Burton was hitting me like, why'd you send that? Uh, <laughs> but we have a lot more time, I guess, than we think in college. And just from talking to a lot of NBA guys and, you know, G League guys, it's like they have very little time to kind of put together their um, – to put together their rotations and, and figure out kind of like who's going to play, right? And I think in college you really have no excuse to figure out who you're going to be playing by the time that first game goes up. Um, obviously things change, but when I was putting together this document, like I, like I found out, like we had 
in our five on five action that we played every day, we had seven games worth of data before um, our first game even happened. And we didn't do like the hustle stats kind of like you guys did, but we just did kind of um, more traditional play by play with some like advanced metrics as well. But um, and did it live. But my question, I had a couple of questions. One was going to be, um, and again, Lamont kind of touched on it, but what was like, what is y'all sort of education process on um, with your managers and grad assistants and how you sort of like kind of allow them to uh, make these grades um, or do you just do it totally as a staff? We do it as a staff. So yeah. again, and that's where it comes down to like, just who you work for and how important it's going to be to your program. But like I, I do offense um, throughout the whole season. Our director of basketball operations does rebounding and then uh, our, our other assistant does defense. So, um, you know, we, we, we do it. And I think that's part of the trust too from the head coach. I think if, probably if we had guys that we were trying to train to do it every year, um, we as a staff just wouldn't, wouldn't trust the data as much. Sure. Yeah. Do you think, and then I guess my other thing was, do you, do you ever think you'll get to the place for you personally or even as a, as a program where you would kind of allow some sort of education process, like to kind of give that, divvy that work up? Or is it more like you're just, we want to know and, and kind of have that well, standard set? The, the thing that I would like to do, like that I, I think is the next step for us really is, is like the video, like second spectrum and the things that like NBA arenas have. Like we've, yeah. we've talked a lot about that. Um, and looked into that stuff to see if like there'd be a way where if we could pay, you know, obviously it's expensive, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, get something where the video could consistently give us a lot of the feedback, which would save us time. Um, but we, we haven't really felt like we'd be able to, to replicate the same thing. But I, I think that would be the next step. Um, you know, again, it, it, it's hard. It takes time. You know, it's, it's like anything. It takes your, your 10,000 hours to get, get used to doing this and, and you get better at statting it. And then obviously as a coach, you get better at reading it and understanding it year to year. Um, so, so it takes time and that, that's where it's, you know, there, that's why we, we don't mind sharing it as well. Um, you know, we don't feel like we're giving away that much of an advantage by sharing it because we've been doing it for so long. Um, so that's, that's part of it. You know, I'll jump in on that too, Chris. You know, when I was uh, at San Diego, we had some of our younger guys, our video guy was, was, uh, was terrific. And I knew he was an aspiring coach and now he's, at a Point Loma Nazarene. And so I'd have him come in and another one of our guys and just, they would be in there taking notes and watching. And so they could get a sense of, you know, kind of like what we were seeing and how we were seeing it. Um, now, again, we were only doing the defensive side of the ball. So it, it went a little bit faster, uh, but different guys had categories and our younger guys were kind of watching and saying, okay, that's what a missed block out is. Okay, this is what this is. But also you got to know too, it, you know, every, a lot of coaches here on the mid-major level, we didn't have, you know, we only have so many guys on the staff, you know, so it wasn't like the, you know, when I was at Arizona State and we had an army of guys and, and uh, we can equip them to, to, to do some of those things. So, um, so yeah, there was some education to it as well, but, but I thought it was such a big deal for us that I, I didn't want to screw it up, you know, because it was, you know, it was guys playing time, you know, and so I didn't want a young guy in there who, who really didn't quite understand what a rotation was or, 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 or he missed a, you know, he missed a coverage in ice or whatever we were, we were statting. So we tried to keep it consistent with the eyeballs and try to keep it with guys who, who really understood what we were doing, but also were at practice every day and we're in our meetings and knew how we were teaching things and knew the breakdown of what we were trying to do. Totally. Totally. No, I think, hey, you, I think okay. Kenneth, man, Kenneth, Sorry. have you guys ever graded in front of your team, maybe a portion of it? And what's your messaging with them while you're doing that? Yeah, we did. We, we did that a, a few times when I was at Columbia, actually. We never did it in San Francisco. But it, again, it, it's a leadership tool. It's a culture thing. It's an accountability thing. Um, so, you know, instead of, instead of going in there and watching film and telling them, like, hey, here's the, here's the rotation. You know, here's, here are the things that, that you, where we need to improve. You know, you're, you're going in there and, and showing them film and saying, well, what do you think on this play? Where, were you in the right spot? And, you know, they'll, they'll own up. Um, and it helps them understand it as well. But, you know, I, it, I think like for this, the one thing about the hustle stats is that like, and Lamont can attest to this is you're not going to get, like there are times where your most talented guys are not the, the best hustle stat guys. So like, we're like, we had a guy that Hoodie and I coached at Columbia, Mato Lowe, who was our best player. He averaged 
18 a game. He was definitely our best player. But he could never crack the top three in hustle stats in his career. And he was like, you know, a, a really good shooter, could make shots off the dribble, um, talented offensive player, but he was a little bit soft defensively. Um, so he can never get up there. So what the hustle stats really do, because uh, offense, defense, and rebounding are, are pretty much weighted the same, is it'll, it'll tell you who your, your toughest guys are and your best decision makers. If, if, you're, if you're good at those two things, you can be good in the hustle stats. So, you know, essentially the things that don't take talent. Um, but I think, like, for us, like, it'll always give us, like, like, the top eight or nine hustle stat guys will be our rotation. And then after that, we'll, we'll decide, uh, you know, who the starters are, uh, who the guys who should be playing more or less minutes. Um, but uh, kind of got off topic there. But I think that's something that, like, we should understand as well. Like, this isn't – it's not shooting out, oh, these are, these are definitely our best players or our all-league potential players. It's just – it's more of a leadership tool and a thing to shape your team, to get you tougher, to get you good at the things that, that don't take talent. And the last thing I would say about it is what it allows us to do as coaches is be – be more positive than, you know, normal, normal coaches because the hustle stats do some of the coaching for us essentially. So, um, you know, like when I was, when I was a player, as I said, like we didn't, we didn't do anything like this at Richmond and we played on really good teams and had a great culture in my opinion, but like the motivation was obviously, you know, you want to be good as a player, but the motivation from the coaches was just like, you know, call you every name in the book. Like, like a lot of people are, it was more old school. And then when I got to Columbia, you know, I respected Kyle. I respected the hell of what St. Mary's had done. And we get out on the court and he's like super positive with all the guys. And it was just like, it was a complete 180. Like I couldn't believe it. And Hoodie could attest to it. Other guys would coach them. Um, but the hustle stats do a lot of the negative coaching for you. Because if you have guys who are, you know, if you have a guy who doesn't lay out for a loose ball, he's just going to get, he's going to get hit for that. It's going to be punitive. So it, 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 he's going to get pushed to the bottom. Um, the guys that don't do those things. So it's, it's a great coaching tool, in my opinion. So certainly not like Coach Wilson used to coach me when I was at, at San Diego, <laughs> all, all sorts of Bs and, and, and Hs. Um, but that's, that's a whole other topic. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, you had some great points on that, Kevin. I agree. You know, um, one of the things when we were at St. Mary's, now, again, this was a long time ago, you know, Randy was also big on, you know, um, who gave up the points. You know, and obviously when you play in a game, there's, there's – there's, there's a mirror of guys who gave up the points. A guy got blown by and a guy didn't rotate. And so anytime that we lost, he'd get the film in there and he'd make yeah. the guys do it. And it, you, I mean, you can imagine the arguments of guys saying, yeah, yeah. No, man, wait, wait a minute. No, I, it was his rotation. I, you know, and so it was, but it was good because again, it was, it was also allowing them to see what coach saw in his eyes and what was important to him. Um, so I thought that was, that was really cool. Um, and we only did that a few times when he was, he was really pissed off. Um, the other thing that I'd say is I agree 100%. We had a guy named Diamond Simpson um, from St. Mary's, and, and he had no idea what hustle stats meant. But on Thursdays and Saturdays, when that ball went up in the air, he knew what time it was. I mean, he scored 1,500 points and, and grabbed 1,000 rebounds in his career, but he could never be on the top of hustle boards. Um, and I think you have to also be careful with the hustle board too, but you have to be careful, but you, you, you just got to be careful because – your older guys will understand it because they've been in it and they'll know how to accumulate points. Exactly. And they, they should be ahead of your younger guys and they should be ahead of your younger guys anyway, because they're older. But typically if your older guys are smart and they've been in the program, they'll figure a way how, out how to, how to, how to value high in that thing, at least, at least early on. But again, like Kevin said, once you play after that first exhibition game, then it becomes, you know, like coach Wilson said, a lot of, a lot of feel and a lot of, Hey, we got to shape our team and, and, and things of that sort. But, but a lot of times, again, it'll be the guys who are at the top that, that end up playing for you. No, great Thanks, job. Kevin, I got it. Oh, I got we'll, a go last, we'll go last question. Go ahead. Uh, Kevin, I got a question for you, man. Dwight Thorne, University of Denver. Um, I know you guys said that you, you rely heavily on it in the preseason, right? Your first practices. Do yeah. you guys do the same for your games as well? And if you do, do you modify it at all? Yeah, we, we keep it for games as well, and we don't modify it. So we, we have it oh. for the end of the year. And it, it's a player development tool for us as well because, obviously, we have it year to year for each guy. So, um, you know, you can – one of the things that's really cool about it is, like, you can see, you know, after – if you meet with a guy after, your, after his sophomore year, 
and you can show him the jump that he made. Like, hey, here's the jump you made in games from your freshman year to your sophomore year and your efficiency rating now in order to make another jump. Here's specifically the areas that you have to improve on. Um, and then you can kind of really, really drill down on those areas. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it's cool too. Like we used to have like Matthew Delvadova's hustle stat from St. Mary's and we'd show it to like our guards at Columbia and like, Hey, here's, you want to be an NBA player. Here's what you have to be. Here's, here's the efficiency rating you need to get to. So over time, it, it's pretty, it's pretty neat when you have, you know, so many guys that have been through it, um, that have been really good players and you can, you can get, compare your team to those guys and, and use it as a way to develop guys. Appreciate it. No, great job, Kevin. And, and he put his info into the uh, chat. If you guys want to follow up with uh, either Hoodie or uh, Coach Hovde, both did a great job. S super detailed, super thorough. Obviously, they're used to this stuff with their programs, um, but definitely reach out to them. Um, and we appreciate having those guys on. And we'll get yeah. to our third. Very, very I'm into oh, yeah. Yep. yeah, no, appreciate it, Kevin. And, and you guys, I'm telling you, man, I, I, I'm a little bit biased because I, I know these guys, Adam and, and Kevin, but two terrific Terrific coaches, got great programs, uh, fun to watch, both both their clubs. Yeah. Dig into these guys, man. I mean, these guys are stars in our business. I mean, Todd Golden, he played for me, uh, and played for us at St. Mary's and and uh, was a walk-on and ended up getting a scholarship. And, I mean, just a bright, bright mind. I mean, San Francisco may have the youngest staff in the country. And, I mean, you know, they're giving, giving Gonzaga everything they want uh, every single year and, and uh, just tremendous young guys. So, again – Plug in to Adam, plug in to Kevin, man. They got good stuff. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Uh, appreciate you guys coming on, and uh, we'll get to our last – try to stay on schedule as best we can, get to our last uh, speaker of the afternoon. Uh, so I met Cody way back in the day training uh, some girls basketball players, I think, back in the day when I was a JUCO assistant uh, from Dallas. And uh, just a down-to-earth dude, man, humble dude, has, has grinded his way. Uh, played at Cornell, was a big-time player there, one of the best three-point shooters that that league has seen, and um, has been in the NBA, has been in the G League, has been a G League head coach, has been an NBA assistant with the Phoenix Suns, uh, player development, and then uh, now he's with um, Penny Hardaway in Memphis as an assistant. And like you would probably imagine, he was missing the first hour because they were had a recruiting Zoom because they're one of the best recruiting staffs in the country. So we're, we're excited to have all three guys on. Um, definitely give us a wealth of knowledge. And Cody's been at all levels, so we'll let him kind of just take it and run with it from here. Awesome. Thanks, guys. I apologize again. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to look forward to going back and, and watching the report, obviously. You know, I know Lamont well, and I respect everything that's going on over in San Francisco. Um, I think that what, what I'd like to do is I'm going to take you guys through some stuff to kind of tell you how we used analytics uh, at the NBA level how we're using analytics uh, at, here at Memphis and, um, you know, kind of talk to maybe about some things that, I don't know, maybe you haven't heard of uh, or heard about and some ways that I think that we can, you know, just be forward thinking and how we, how we operate just uh, with everything. All right. So share, can I share my screen here? Yep. All right. Share. All right. Everybody can see this. So like this, this, this quote right here to me just just defines everything that I try to be about, right? Be stubborn about your goals, but progressive in your methods. And if there's anything that's where that's going on, it's going on over in San Francisco. You know, where these guys are committing fouls to get possessions back in the first half, things of that nature. I mean, that's off the charts. I just love that type of thinking, right? Because and I and I and I, I proposed this question to um, a couple of coaches. You know, randomly we're having a dinner. It was like, hey, if I give you a VHS tape, could you play that thing at your house right now? And everybody, I mean. Nobody raised their hand. If I gave you a DVD, could you play it? Hell, my computer doesn't even, doesn't even play DVDs right now. If you gave me one, I couldn't play it. You know, so that then, you know, I just made the joke. You don't want to be the last guy relying on mid-range jumpers to win basketball games. And I think that it all comes down to the quote, right, this is how we've always done it, being just a deadly quote because it's going to kill you from being progressive. I mean, a lot of you guys have seen this stuff. I don't want to be redundant in nature. But what I'm looking at is can we be ahead of the curve? Can we pro be progressive in how we look at the game of basketball? And if there's one thing I learned from the Houston Rockets organization, who when I was with their G League team, RGV Vipers, I mean, the amount of data that we had access to and the amount that we were encouraged to be uh, experimental uh, really just kind of changed the way I think about things. And if there's one thing I respect about some of the great coaches at the NBA level, specifically a guy like Eric Spolstra, is how he significantly changes his philosophies from year to year based upon his personnel. 
It's, it's unbelievable. They lose us on white side. We got Bam out of bio leading the break. They're running all these high above the break, double stagger screens, these corver screens, right? And how they're flowing into things, how random is beautiful and their spacing concepts. And the big thing is, is that we all learn, yeah, we've got to coach what we feel. We've got to coach what we know. Um, but to me, uh, the big thing is to always be learning, right? And then coach what you learn. I think that's a huge element because the, like, and, and it's funny because uh, another guy, Hubie Brown, right? Like, so Mike Miller here played for Hubie. And we always start talking about, you know, what, how Hubie did things. But the unique thing is that the same offense that Hubie was running with Mike, what made Hubie a great coach was that it wasn't the same offense he ran in, hell, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. It's not the same offense he'd be running now. So the ability to change with the times and see what's next is huge. So to me, uh, analytics is nothing more than the use of large data sets to help us make uh, informed decisions. And as far as I can tell, that works for uh, Jeff Bezos over at Amazon. So I think, you know, we should uh, probably look to employ some of these things ourselves, right? Uh, first thing here that I'm sure we've all seen right here is the shot spectrum. I mean, the Rockets really introduced it to the game of basketball. Uh, and, you know, they started experimenting with their G League team. Uh, when I went to Northern Arizona, uh, basically I brought that kind of philosophy with me back to the Phoenix Suns organization. This was actually our shot chart from my time in Northern Arizona. Um, and I think a big thing is obviously us always uh, analyzing and evaluating our shot charts uh, as a program and on an individual level and analyzing these shot charts after every single game, which is what we do at the NBA level with our pre and post game reporting. Um, we only shot 6% of our shots were in the mid range. We actually shot the highest percent on those shots uh, in the, in the league, right? So we shot 44% on those shots, but we took the fewest amount, right? Uh, and, and, you know, we, we really, again, you guys are all probably well versed in stuff like the field goal percentage. So we'll go to some other cool things that we were looking at, uh, which is what we call good play percentage. What percentage of our scoring possessions come from high value zones, right? And that is obviously free throws, rim attempts, or three point shots. And for us, when we were in uh, Northern Arizona, 87% uh, of our possessions came. Uh, I was trying to think about and figure, hey, well, what, are, what should a goal be? And when I looked at kind of across, you know, the league, the NBA level and across the league at the, uh, the G League level, to me, I really think you're going to be forward thinking if you can try to get to 80 percent of your scoring possessions coming from high value zones. Um, and a big key behind that, too, is people understanding that you don't just chase high value shots, but you actually have to structure your offense to create high value shots. And those are entirely two different mentalities. Right. People talk about why does the triangle offense, you know, why would it not be successful today? And it's really apples to oranges, entirely different game. Right. And the other thing is, if you just took the triangle offense, and you said, hey, let's just shoot more threes. Right. Well, that's an offense that generates more mid range shots. So chasing a three point shot in and of itself, looking at it in a vacuum is not necessarily a high value shot. And of course, we know there's a personnel element behind that specific more more so at the NBA level, I'll say. Um, but we also you know, we made 14.9 percent of our threes and all of these charts right here. I'm big on data visualization. How can we see where are we at in relation to the whole? Right. And I think that's a big thing is understanding where you're at within your conference, within your league. Right. And who's doing something different. And if so, if we analyze these different factors, maybe we can figure out why are they doing something different. And then that'll also help us with the opponent scout uh, portion. Um, but again, I, one thing that we did uh, in Phoenix, too, with Igor, that was huge is we always tried to show where we were at in re relative to these other teams with charts and boards and things of that nature. And I think that that was huge, something simple that shows, hey, are we, being, are we better at these things this year than we were last year? So we had this specific chart right here. This was the final one that we had for Northern Arizona. But every five games, this would come up on our film session, right, and say, hey, listen, man, we're, we're improving here, right, because there's wins and there's wins. And we're not just going to judge ourselves based on the final box score. Um, again, pace, right? So this is, uh, this, is our, this is a chart right here for all NBA teams, all NBA teams right here. There's not a single team that scores at a higher OER the longer they have the ball, right? This is all logical. We all, we all know this when we think about it. Um, but the funny thing is, I think more from a college mentality is we preach the first side, second side, third side, fourth side, fifth side. So, you know what I mean? We preach the song that never ends in terms of saying that we need to slow down, especially if we don't have as much talent, right? So the thought process is if I'm, you know, uh, playing at Cornell or Columbia or whatever, and we go play a high major opponent, man, we need to slow this game down. We need there to be fewer possessions. And, you know, the reality of it is for, for uh, all the college teams that I've seen as well and looked at and studied before last season was 
uh, this trend actually holds true at the college level. We know fast break is fast break, but to me, the next five seconds is where the NBA has really figured out how to play conceptually, right? And they've taken their big jump forward is teams getting shots within the first 10 seconds. I can tell you here uh, in Memphis, we shot 56.3% on shots taken in the first 10 seconds. We operated 28.6% of our percent of our offense in the first 10 seconds of the shot clock. Now the next 10 seconds, we shot 45% in the last 10 seconds, 32%. And so for us, we knew we were incentivized uh, to attack a defensive in, in transition and try to attack them before they can get set after that initial push. Uh, but it's one thing to understand it. And then it's the next thing to, again, build your offensive philosophies around it. One example would be at the Phoenix Suns, we had the youngest team in the NBA. Uh, and we were trying to figure out, man, why are we not uh, able to play faster and find shots earlier in the, in, in the clock, a higher volume of shots earlier in the clock? Well, thanks to Second Spectrum, you know, we were able to figure out that we might have had the youngest team and when, the, and when the ball was actually inbounded, we were actually one of the quickest at getting it over uh, half court into the opponent's coach's hash. However, we were one of the slowest on made baskets on real-time seconds that went by between time of made basket to time of inbound, right? So we were slow at getting the ball back in play. So we started scripting and rehearsing how to get the ball back in play. That's a little way that analytics can help, help you take a jump forward, right? So now all of a sudden, you know, we're, we're not preaching a certain guy bringing the ball in bounds. We're preaching – nearest guy bringing the ball in bounds, right? We're preaching five only bring the ball in bounds if he's in the restricted, right? So we're trying to figure out ways that we can go back at these guys and, and, uh, and try to attack them before they can get set so that we can try to get a shot within the first 10 seconds of the clock. And if anybody has any questions, I mean, I prefer this to be uh, an opportunity for you guys to just jump in. Um, some different things right here, and I want to show you some stuff. We'll, we'll talk about offensive efficiency rating by play call. Um, and I think that this is probably the most underused element of, uh, of analytics. And this is what I did in, in Northern Arizona. Um, what we did was we would, uh, and, and, I, and I think this also opens, opens up to a discussion about, about what's next on things like uh, shot quality and quantified shooter impact. But uh, right here, what we did was we would take all of our different series, right? We break it down. And these were our points per possession by series, last three games, last five games, and all games, right? And then what we'd also do is we'd look at plays that were called five times or fewer within the last five games because these are plays that were least likely to be scouted. And so now all of a sudden having this type of information, if we're coming out of a timeout situation, you know, I would know going into that game, uh, you know, I can pull up one of my game cards, but I scripted out the game. So I scripted first and second play out of every single timeout. Uh, and basically stuck to that for sure for the first half. And then we had audible check downs moving into the second half. And obviously into games, we had our need, uh, you know, need scenarios. But understanding which ones we had run heavily allow, allowed us to take advantage of, uh, of opponents not scouting out. You know, nobody's scouting more than five games out, especially, you know, NBA level games are coming fast, right? So um, that was big. And then we take that series and we break it down even even further right into the actual play call subsets within each series. And we would break that down to last five games, last three games. And then we'd break that down in uh, wins and losses. And another value on the wins versus losses is, you know, for me as a coach, you know, with our on-demand series, I could be like, Hey, down here, you see, you know, 21 chase, right. You know, a little more, a little more 21 chase in our, in our losses than our wins, but in our wins, a little more Nash. Right. So now just ca having that little reminder, hey, a little more Nash, a little more Nash. Right. Helps me kind of think when time situations when I need to dial something up for our guys. Right. What to have what to have prepared. And and I would review this with our, uh, you know, with my assistant before uh, before every game. And so we'd have a plan going in. And then me and Igor, we would review this before every game. Uh, we'd have coffee at about seven in the morning. We would dial up what he called uh, the menu for the game. And uh, then all of our ATO sets, we would script, uh, we would run in script during five on O during shoot around, uh, as well as like our first play of the game, right? So nothing uh, at the NBA level uh, is happening by accident. I can assure you of that. And so you can just kind of see, I mean, all this stuff serves a purpose, right? And it just gives us a, a, an understanding of who we are, right? So there's a huge value in terms of analytics when we're taking a look at ourselves. And it opens up to the, to the conversation of quantified shooter impact, which is, I think is really what's the next horizon for, um, you know, for analytics. And that is on those stats that I just showed you, points per possession on each play call. But 
just because we ran the play and scored doesn't mean the play actually worked. Doesn't mean we created a high value shot out of the play, right? So some of that data could be skewed in a negative way. And so in order to, to weed that out, really there's, there's two ways you can go, right? We talked about hustle stats as I got on here and, you know, Lamont touched on, you got to have, you know, having the same set of eyes on the same scenario is going to allow you to reduce, uh, you know, muddy data, right? It's going to allow you to keep your data, you know, square on. And the same thing's true if you're going to use the eye test to determine whether or not a play worked, right? If we call a particular play and we come out and run it and, you know, one guy thinks, well, okay, well, that, that was kind of an open shot. This is a good look or whatever the case may be, um, you know, Maybe, maybe we didn't score on that play, but we got a butt naked shot. Well, that play worked, right? But we just didn't get the points. Uh, so what the NBA has, because, they have, uh, because they're gathering the XY data through Sucking Spectrum, is they have what's called quantified shooter impact and expected uh, field goal percentage. So they can run all the calculations, right, on all the stipulations, proximity of defender, shot location, all these different things to determine, you know, what the average shooter – uh, under those circumstances would be expected to shoot, right? So we've all seen it maybe on Sports Center at various times. They've used the thing where you see the, you know, if he shoots, you see the field goal percentage deal going up and down. And, and that is, uh, you know, just what the expected is. Now, uh, for instance, Devin Booker might take a shot that the average player shoots at 45% and he might shoot it at 55%. So his quantified shooter impact is plus 10 effective field goal percentage points, right? So, he's shooting above expected. Uh, and that's normal for like superstar level players, right? Like a Kevin Durant or whatever the case may be. But what you want to do is make sure that you're evaluating these, those types of things. So you have a, a understanding. I use uh, expected um, and quantified shooter impact a lot in my player development stuff, right? When I sit down with book, I can say, listen, man, on these particular shots, you know, you're shooting, you know, 15 percentage points above, you know, league average. I mean, that's, that's an incredible stat. But on these, you're actually below league average and you're a great shooter. Well, let's dial in on this particular scenario. We can lock in on that. Um, and I think that's where, where analytics is, is you know, can, can really uh, be taken to the next level because shot quality can happen on a possession. It can happen player by player. But what you can also do, and this is what we had in Houston first, was expected box scores. So in our pre and post game packets, all right, our post game packet, uh, it would take into account uh, the shot quality of every – uh, shot that was taken in that game and it would come up with an expected points per possession on every single shot and the damnedest thing you would get is hey we should have won this game right think about that right all the coaches and we're sitting in the coach man this is some bs right here like what are we looking at you know what i mean like man and, and but it, but the interesting aspect of it is is what is valuable out of an expected score right number one is did we get good shots and just miss them that night right that helps us understand that. Two is, did we limit their good shots, but they just made them that night? As frustrating as it, it can be to lose a game where the expected score is you plus five or seven, right? Understanding that stuff can help you understand and mitigate, you know, kind of your emotions with your team, right? Going into that next team meeting. Guys, listen, they made some tough shots, right? But we were right there. We forced the ones that we wanted. And it just allows you to have a better – uh, uh, pulse really on like where you're at on both sides of the basketball. Uh, the other thing is defensive analytics, uh, which is, you know, becoming bigger and bigger. And, and, and it's, it's, this is where, you know, you've got your two factions in the NBA and kind of what I ended up being, um, you know, I actually, I got, uh, you know, I studied like finance and economics and all that type of stuff. And so, you know, I, and then I got burst in, you know, in analytics with, the, with Houston and all that stuff. So I became our liaison. I was our coaching staff liaison to the analytics department. And um, you've got these guys who are, who are really fervently sitting on one or the other side of this fence, right? And we've got like this imaginary wall up and it's like, hey, the basketball guys, and then it's these numbers geeks over here, you know what I mean? And the thing is, people always say, hey, man, video don't lie. And then the numbers guys are going to say numbers don't lie. And the, the reality of it is, is the truth lies somewhere in between. Uh, just an example right here is uh, when we, when, in Phoenix, uh, pick and roll coverage. Uh, so... Uh, we decided, uh, you know, early on, like we don't want to teach DeAndre to, to be back first. We wanted him to be up at the level of the screen, right? So we wanted to impact the ball at the level of the pick and roll. We were going to take a, a page out of the Oklahoma City Thunder uh, playbook in regards to our pick and roll coverage. And we, you know, we get a sample size in and now I'm breaking down the numbers and I'm like, man, like, I'm, I'm like Igor, like we're not, this is not working for us. We are not good at this, man, but we need to be like OKC. Like we can, we can be like OKC. That's not what he said, but you know, the general thermostat on our staff was turning that direction. 
and we got some of the numbers back. I mean, great number right here. We are number one in contesting mid-range shots in the pick and roll. And then, you know, I'm in there and I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Let's look at who's the best at guarding the pick and roll, right? Number one, right? In points per direct, points per chance, all these different things. And when I look at it, um, you know, Oklahoma City is actually not good, number one, right? So that was one factor in us changing our coverage. But number, number two, all the top teams in the NBA were actually not challenging that shot. That was not a contested shot. So they were conceding the mid-range jump shot in the pick and roll. And what they were trying to do is get their big back to the roll man, right? No, no roller behind mentality in their coverages so that they had the one-on-one -on -one box out situation, right? And so by contesting these, once we did a further deep dive, we found that these weren't rear view contests. These were DeAndre contests. So now by DeAndre closing out up the line, he took himself out of the rebounding position on the other side. Uh, not to mention on, on other situations, right? Teams who are aggressive at the point of the screen were conceding high rim rate and high corner three rate. Well, why is that, right? We know that the film piggybacks that by roller gets behind, ball gets behind, pressure on the low man, the next obvious pass is going to be that corner three. So what you're doing by being aggressive at the point of the screen and the pick and roll at the NBA level is you're really compromising yourself uh, at the rim and you're compromising yourself at the corner. And those are two of the most high value shots, putting a lot of pressure on your backside guy who's also more likely to foul. So what a lot of teams at the NBA level now are doing is they're playing two on two in the pick and roll. I mean, hell, San Francisco's probably doing it. I didn't watch, but uh, just knowing the way that, that they are, right, forward thinking is – mentality has shifted drift. So the big thing though is, is the numbers in that, in that perspective, right, could be skewed. You give a coach a, just a sheet of, of numbers and it says, hell, we're, man, we're green is good, right? And that's how we always had ours set up. And I'll kind of show you uh, like in my Lakers scouting report here, like green is good, red is bad, but that could be misleading, right, as well. So um, this is an example of a uh, scouting report for a March, March 2nd game here. Uh, against the Lakers. And um, I'll also show you what we have out here in Memphis as well. But um, people talk a lot about um, using, using numbers and to evaluate and that this, it can get overwhelming. And so the big thing to me is like, I'm not going to sit here and walk you, you know, guys through like everything here. We all know a lot of these stuff, like the four factors and things of that nature. But to me, it's all about identifying trends, right? So when I'm looking at these things, my eyes gravitate towards certain certain things, right? Whether it's a uh, three point field goal rate being low, right? They're not shooting a lot of threes, right? Percentage also being low, right? So this is an area right here that we can exploit, right? Percentage and volume low. Uh, guys not, you know, not, not typically looking to, uh, to shoot a high volume of these shots. So maybe we change one of our coverages or maybe we help off of a specific guy a little bit more. Uh, you know, we play that Rover concept, right? Maybe we're more likely to tag in this game because we think that the role is what's going to kill us, right? And then we've also got offensive actions right here. We've got the attempts per game. We've got the efficiency. Defensive actions, we've got the same. And uh, we use all this then to, to put together the scouting report. And for Igor, we had to write – it was like writing Gone with the Wind. But um, I'll, I'll turn your uh, uh, testament here to this uh, substitutions right here, right? So we'll take, we'll take the information on their substitution patterns, which are right here. So I'll have their last five game substitution patterns. And then what I'll do is I'll try to anticipate their substitutions. And what I would try to do was uh, have a plan for how we're going to adjust our matchups or our coverages based upon their substitutions, right? And so we had a couple of distinct uh, plans here. Number one, and then, and then we always had our, our go-to, our first adjustment and our second adjustment. And what we ended up doing, for instance, in this particular game that we won, uh, the numbers showed that LeBron, uh, this is another second spectrum number that we got, was at point of first contact, LeBron was able to gain 15 feet of ground on average uh, on a drive. So that means when he made contact with his defender, right, he usually, before picking the ball up, ended up 15 feet closer to the basket. Like, think about that, right? That's crazy. So for us, we said, well, screw it. Uh, you know, we don't, we don't care about uh, – we, we, don't, we don't care about uh, – Oh boy, McGee, right? So we're gonna put we're gonna put uh, Kelly Oubre on McGee. Let's put Le, uh, DeAndre and LeBron, right? And that's like a that's like a different matchup than you would than you would think, right? But you know, ultimately we ended up winning this game, and that was a big help because LeBron's a guy who tries to use his physicality, right? So using analytics to make that adjustment was big for us. Um, the other thing that we always have is our situational player statistics, 
which I think just give us a good tail of the tape. And especially when you look at like offensive player actions, right. And, and, you know, this is a uh, great understanding of like LeBron, for instance, 21, 24 pick and rolls a game. Right. So, you know, you can, you can really get as micro as you want. And uh, to me like that, this is, this is just kind of giving you a cheat sheet and a roadmap. Um, and then you can see our offensive efficiency by play call as well has a sheet. And then you can kind of see what way we haven't separated here is uh, shot spectrum information as well as like, uh, uh, rankings. So, and, and after every game, like I would write up uh, our analytics summary and our, and our deal and give this to coach. And this was kind of like the layman's terms, like, you know, what the F was all that other shit that, that I had to look at to scroll down to get to this. But um, that uh, to me was, uh, was big. And, you know, a analytics plays a huge role in, in everything going on in the NBA. Um, let's talk about player development and use of analytics in practice, right? So now we talk about load. Um, you know, load management's a big point of contention at the college level, you know, depending on who you ask. I don't know if Archie's on here, right? He gave his, his, uh, his, his little <laughs> his information on that. But the big thing is this, and I, and I worked uh, also significantly as director of player development. I worked significantly with our performance staff, uh, and I was the liaison between them and our coaching staff as well. And so the big thing that we had in terms of that was, um, you know, it, there's perceived load. There's mechanical load and there's chronic load. And the big thing, perceived load is all about like how your mind responds, right? And your body's going to follow. And so, uh, and this is where like psychoanalytics kind of comes into the next curve as well. That's kind of picking up traction. But um, if you went to walk to just, you know, hit the golf course or whatever, you know, and you go walk a whole, walk 18 holes, you're going to be tired, right? We're, we're shorter at the end of our day than we are when we get out of bed for a reason, right? And that's because the load of our bodies, right? 9.8 meters per second squared, all of us learned in school, right? Is, is just, it's, it's, it's wearing on us. So whereas we like to think that load is nothing and I, God knows how Michael Jordan can go play 18 holes in golf and be a savage in the game of basketball, it makes no sense. But we also have to understand that people's bodies react differently. And if our whole goal is to have us uh, performing at optimal levels, we've got to be conscientious of this. So uh, what we actually did was we would use our opponent's information right here, you can see, uh, we would use our, our opponent's information uh, to understand if this was going to be, well, what intensity level this game, upcoming game was going to be at, right? And you can use just things like pace, right? So you can see the notes right here. Uh, so I put down, you know, that, that Sacramento, they play fast. Second in the league in pace. So we know that we have to be ready for an up and down game, right? And so then uh, our recommendations for practice uh, on this day was that high minute players should perform no more than 11 full speed transition defensive reps. And what we were tracking was high speed accelerations, high speed decelerations, uh, max jumps and repeated jumps. And so, you know, this information helps us understand that if we want our guys to be at the best, recommended practice length, right, is going to be, you know, under 60 minutes. Now, no coach really likes to hear that. But again, you know, do we want seven o'clock players? We want 10 a.m. players, right? So it's, it ends up being our choice at the end of the day. So um, the other thing that we did was we developed an app, right? So Second Spectrum gathers hundreds of data points per second does all this stuff. Um, but during practice, minimal amounts of data are collected, right? And um, this was where what we wanted to do was we developed a player development app that would chart, map, and uh, keep track of every session that any of our players did uh, during the year. And it was really easy to use. Every single coach, video, intern, everybody had access to this app. And <clears throat> so we actually are using the app here uh, in Memphis uh, as well. And what we would do now in the app too, is we added a mindset element, right? So we talked about psychoanalytics. One thing we did in Phoenix was when a guy's come into the building, uh, one of our trainers would go over and ask him on a scale, basically on a scale of one to 10, how's your day, right? Shittiest day ever, or, you know, man, best day ever, you know, uh, whatever it is, I just had a child or whoever's right. You know, you don't know, right? So, and uh, then we'd also ask them coming off the floor, you know, scale of one to 10, how hard was this practice? And, uh, the funny thing is that the guys who rated practices harder usually were having shittier days to begin with, you know, and, and, you know, you and me, we, we do the same practice. We could have a different feeling towards uh, the difficulty, but any session that was undertaken by any of our players, we would rate their mindset, right? So we'd rate their mindset at the, be at the beginning, low energy, ready to work mindset at the end, mailed it in, gave max effort. We'd rate receptivity engagement where they detached collaborative and, and overall comprehension on whatever the skills that we worked on. Um, now, obviously, this, these psychoanalytics are subjective, but again, it holds value uh, when you kind of 
put it in the context of the whole. And so, for instance, this is Precious's workout plan. We know that he did 296 sessions. We know how many were team, how many were group, how many were solo. We know how many were uh, on court versus film. We know how many were team film versus individual film. And then we've got his player mindset chart and we've got his focus emphasis. Um, and, you know, so, so to me, this is just kind of gives you a snapshot of the player and where he's at. Uh, and then on the right, also what we did, which was something, and, and I mean, I want to have second spectrum in our practice facility. Like that's the ultimate next, next. Right. But uh, we charted uh, everything we could. Uh, we were, we were keeping track of, and, you know, I, Steve Donahue over at the university of Pennsylvania, my college coach, I mean, you know, he finds, he's finding those three or four, uh, you know, guys that, that have a uh, progressive mentality, maybe they're in the computer science department or whatever. I mean, all this stuff that we did. So we developed the app and I'll show you some of the other stuff we're doing with analytics here, but I mean, we, we, we have a budget. I can assure you the budget is not being spent on this stuff, right? Cause Penny just wants to see that one page bullet point deal, but he's also very open to understanding what it's about and how we can, how we should change things. So right here with, with precious every single day, uh, in September and October and November, he came in, he did our Tiger 100. We've got a bunch of variations. Tiger 100, we got the Mike Miller 100, got the Penny Hardaway 100. I don't have my own 100 maybe one day, but I doubt that. And so for us, you can, we, we chart his, you know, his percentages. Left corner, left high quad, right corner, right high quad. And so you can see right here, he, he had growth in each of these areas, except for from October to November from the right corner. And uh, the interesting thing on that is, I'll just kind of, pull one thing up to allow you guys to see another thing that I think draw that I think makes it interesting is like okay well right corner in practice not so great okay cool whatever but you know what about uh you know where is where is he in terms of you know in the games and so you can see right here his his heat map right I mean he's far better and more efficient in everything that he does on the left side of the floor versus the right side of the floor so now we know that he's clearly not comfortable there, but we also know that he's successful there. So coming out of timeout situations, right, even though he's a right-handed player, we might want to look to get him set up somewhere on the left side of the floor and evaluate which direction he's driving uh, off the closeouts that are being created in the natural, natural and organic situations to then try to take advantage and exploit uh, his strengths, um, you know, and play more chess than checkers, if you will. So, um, you know, that's why, that, that's how it's being used in, this was uh, Booker's right here, play, you know, his player development chart. Uh, and, and the other thing, too, when you look down at, like, book stuff, too, we compare our in-game shot charts to our practice shot charts and try to identify those strengths and weaknesses by that. Um, and, you know, we use it, and, and what we do is we create, like, a SWOT analysis. I mean, it's just like a business term, as you guys have all heard, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, and, and uh, we use a lot of dashboard vis vis visualization. And the big thing in Phoenix was – you know, again, we can't only look at the box score if we're going to go for wins because that'll, I mean, that might be why I am bald. Actually, I'm kidding. I was bald before I got there, but I didn't have all this gray in my beard. So, you know, I mean, we, we didn't have a good roster. Like we weren't going to be competing for a playoff spot no matter what we did. So, um, you know, this was a way that we could, you know, let our guys know that while it's not looking great, you know, on Sports Center, we are improving. Um, last thing I'll share with you guys, and then if anybody's got any questions, is what we're doing here uh, at Memphis. So this is our pregame report in Memphis. You can see a lot of similarities. Um, you know, we uh, – I, I just really love the, you know, the, the color layout. I think it it's, makes it easier to draw your attention to, you know, the good, the bad, and the ugly. We are the most turned over mother effers this side of the, the Mississippi. But – we were number one in the country at defending the rim, number two in the country at defending the three-point line. So, I mean, there's a lot of good to take from this. And this kind of can help you figure out where to focus practice time as well. And it also helps you figure out, well, the opponent you're playing, like what are they doing, right? And where are they good uh, on offense and where have they been successful on the defensive side? And then what I include down here for Penny is just our, you know, some generalizations, right? Some of it is big-time logical connection, real easy. Um, you know, some of it's a little bit more in-depth. But, uh, you know, we have our game goals and we use, uh, you know, it doesn't look pretty here, right? Average game goals reached on offense was only two, defense four. But our game goals, we were looking at the average of the top five teams in the NCAA 2018-19 uh, in these different categories and, um, you know, coming up with that information there. And then what we were also doing is uh, we would have our post-game report. All this stuff's auto-generated. Nobody has to do anything but 
uh, fire up our stuff because what I did was went out and uh, we got, uh, you know, I just got some computer science guys that like basketball that uh, they can do the coding for me. And, uh, you know, so we're, we, we, we have APIs with different data services and, you know, we, this stuff's all auto generated. And so we pulled this stuff into the reports and uh, it kind of coordinates itself. And, you know, again, our, our budget is, you know, maybe for storage, uh, cloud storage, like 50 bucks a month. So we get to see, you know, if we achieve the goal, if we didn't achieve the goal, we get to, we get to see if it was, you know, an extreme, like yellow is going to point to anything that is considered extreme per our parameters. Um, and then, you know, like obviously 10 rim, 10 rim attempts, we know that's low, great job. We kept them off the rim. Again, you can see, you know, 335 and turnover percentage, you know, <laughs> not good. So uh, again, little roadmap for success, but we also always look at our extended box store, uh, which to me has great value. Um, instead of just having all the traditional stuff, we have effective field goal percentage, rebounding percentages, usage percentages, and then good take percentage. And again, that's what percentage of our guys' shots were from high value zones. And uh, we have it for the defense as well. And I think that that's, uh, you know, just, just expanding your box score and looking at things with this light uh, can, can help take you to, to some different levels. And then you can see, you know, some of these, these would be like trends that we identified, like that we wanted to take a look at within the game. So, um, and then of course our reporting insights are down at the bottom and you can see how simplified these are, right? Because this whole report can be extremely overwhelming. I understand that. And so what I learned early on is if you can't translate it, it's, uh, it's just like walking, you know, walking into, you know, Spanish, you know, fifth year, fourth year Spanish, right. You know what I mean? Or, you know, taking one Spanish class and then everybody said, man, God damn it. You can't speak Spanish. You mother. Effort. It's like, yeah, no, like it takes a little bit more. So what I try to do is just translate all this stuff down here and, and make it as simple as I can for, for our guys, this is a similar process that is happening at the NBA. So um, that's all I got on that end. I don't know if anybody has any questions about stuff. I can, can answer yeah, those. I, I got one question, if that's okay. When you're talking about the uh, offensive efficiency by play calls, so um, during the season, uh, I was kind of uh, getting the numbers for each of our plays, and we, we ran a play maybe six, seven times during non-conference, and we made – four out of five three-pointers. And so we started running in a bunch during conference and didn't do so well because everyone started scouting that. So we started getting weary about plays that we we're doing well, but not as frequent. Uh, it, would y'all just, whenever y'all are doing uh, successful in a play, y'all just keep on trying it more? Or would you be weary on some plays so teams don't scout it so much? So uh, this goes to... Um drives right into what I would call also a discussion on progressive offense, right? Um, the NBA, it, there's, I mean, you've got a million sets. You teach out of play calls, but what they are is they're actually reads and solutions. So it's conceptually based, right? So if you go back to uh, our offensive efficiency rating deal or whatever, our 21 series, 21 was like our on-demand stuff. Our ATO package was separate. Right. So what we had, and, and this, that's why I would get together with Igor in the morning. We'd look at how we did last time with our various play calls. Right. But not everything is actually a play that's called like our guys are, we just tell them we want 21. Boom. They're going to go execute 21. Now that doesn't mean the coach can't come up there and be like, Hey, chase it, chase it, chase it. Right. That's just a cue to get into 21 chase or gnash it, gnash it, gnash it. Um, or, you know, more delay. We need more delay or whatever it is. But, um, you know, we're not, we, we're not walking it up and calling plays. Same thing we're doing here, right? So we're allowing our guys to play organically. Now your ATO package is separate, right? Where we're coming out and we're trying to dial up something based on, uh, you know, a look that we think we're going to get because of a way that they're covering something or based upon a way that we think we can, you know, uh, exploit their coverage and force them to change it, things of that nature. Um, so I, I think take it back to your situation, right? Okay, early non-conference, you guys started killing this, running this play where it went well, right? It was good. And I don't know how, what volume it was, but I'm sure that early in conference too, it started to work, but then everybody scouted it. So that's why our, our, our specials, right? That Igor would call them, our, our crunch time stuff, uh, we would cycle through that. Like Brad Stevens, right? His play card is going to change every game. Um, and same thing with Igor. And it, it was an extensive 
playground. I'll, sh I'll show you guys one just because I think that's maybe an under, you know, uh, the planning that goes into the NBA maybe I think is also something where, you know, us as college coaches, because a free throw opportunity is an ATO, right? If you're really good, if you've got dial-ups now, a free throw can become, hey, we know we're getting a quick hitter coming back. Um, but that re requires great organization. And then, you know, you've got to have things separated on in terms of on demand. Like that's something that when a guy's in the middle of dribbling the ball at the court, if you yell it, they execute it, right? And then you've got to just also mix that in with allowing them to play where you just say nothing, right? It's just, here you go. Um, and they're going to naturally organically get into one of these various things. And then, um, you know, you have your menu, right, that you're going to go to where you're like, okay, like we haven't run this for five games. Like this is the one that's going to get us a three. You know, so in the, if, for instance, in our Phoenix Suns playbook, man, we had 10 different gate plays, right, like uh, out of the same formation, right? So you're thinking, oh, shit, how are you, you going to scout for that now? It's the same formation. Uh, you can't. And that's the other thing that, that if you want to be unscoutable, you should only probably use, I know, so Brad Stevens, he's operating on make and miss. So they're going to be five out on, on, uh, on misses and they're going to be all big ahead on makes and they're going to play, uh, you know, with a, with a standard, you know, formation out of their four step alignment where they're going to get more step up screens out of after teams opponents make, um, you know, we had a, a few families, but I wouldn't have too, too, you know, more than that. Cause Igor would always say we can find the scoring action within a specific family already. Right. Like Spain for us was shoulder. So he's like, Hey, we can, how can we find, shoulder out of open four? How can we find shoulder out of open pass? How can we find shoulder out of, you know, open dive kamikaze? And so shoulder was just what we added at the end. And there was always a logical connection for our players. I don't know if that helped or if I confused you even more, bro. Yeah, no, that, that, that helped. I really appreciate it, man. Thank you. Absolutely. Cody, I'm, I'm going to pull this for you. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Big, no, big time job so far, man. Um, definitely great for us to just you know, everybody we coach on the men's side, whether you're in high school, whether you're in college, all want to eventually get to the NBA. So just get them to understand how detail-oriented that level is and how much you have to be able to think and play is important. What What do you think as far as your – so you've been a G League head coach, you've been an NBA assistant, you, you're now back in college at a high uh, major situation. What is the things that you found to be the hardest to implement as far as analytics, and what do you think um, are the things that – are kind of the common threads or, or easier things to kind of put in place for, for players to understand, let alone your coach. Cause I'm sure Penny, even though he played in the NBA, he didn't play in the NBA during the, the during the time of analytics. So how hard was that too? I know that's a lot of stuff in one, but. Hey, uh, can you guys hear me? A little bit. Everybody can hear me? Yeah, you can hear me now. Hold up, I can't hear you guys. There we go. All right. So um, that's a great question, right? So first I'll, I'll talk about like shot selection. People always say, man, like uh, one of the people, what, uh, a lot of big, the misconception about like the Houston Rockets is they say, let me like, don't take mid range. Right. And while I was there when Dan Tony first came in and, you know, he had this great analogy, like I coached Toby Bryant, I coached Carmelo Anthony and that was a bad shot for them. And we showed the numbers and it's a bad shot for everyone you mother efforts in this gym too. Right. Like there's that, but outside of the very first day, like he was there, like that, that's not how uh, shot selection priorities are finding their way into these teams right now. Um, Cause when you tell a player, he can't do something, he's probably more likely to do some stupid shit to try to prove you wrong. Right. So instead of that, what we started doing was just devaluing those shots in everything we did across the board. So a non paint two uh, was if you didn't get into the paint, you're only going to get one point. We'll give you one point if you make it, but we're going to devalue that shot so that you understand that that's not a, that's, a, that's not, you know, that's, that's good defense. That's good defense. And um, we'd give you two, you know, if you got into the paint and if you hit a you know, corner three worth four above the break three worth three. And so we did that uh, here in Memphis. And so that really helped our guys just understand shot selection. So basically we got them to understand effective field goal percentage without using the word effective field goal percentage. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that that was a little bit of a key. I mean, hell, I've coached Chris Walker, right? If he took a 10-minute walk and left his house, he'd get lost. So, you know, for, for us, using an analytically forward-thinking deal and having a deep playbook when I'm coaching this guy, um, it's how is this information presented, which also goes to your opponent scout information, right? And this is like a historic conversation, right? If, you, if, you, if I say that, 
that your team is going to remember two out of these three things, which two are most important. Your base coverage is their personnel, right, or their plays. Like, what's your two, right? Everybody could be different. For me, it comes down to personnel and our base coverages. And that's why game plan adjustments at the NBA level, um, you, you know, you're always playing really, really good players, but it, you can't change your entire coverage. You can't change your scheme. Like, you can't do that. Now, you can't say, hey, okay, so we got Steph Curry tonight, right? So we're going to go hot guy, teeter-totter, like, which for us was the, our terminology for let Draymond shoot that mother effer as much as he can from three. You know what I mean? So now we get our, our guys are rover, and, you know, we're going to be attached, like, and then it's like, hey, are we a switching team? Are we not? Then our guys just have to do what they do. Um, and so to me, like, that's a big element. And what will our guys, what do we share with our guys? We actually don't share anything with our guys. We don't give them a piece of paper. None of our guys in Phoenix got a piece of paper. What they got was uh, personnel edits that were sent to their iPad. And on those personnel edits, uh, you know, it would just be like, there would be like a title slide, just reemphasizing our base coverages. And um, then any game plan adjustments would be in there as well with videos uh, demonstrating them. So you mean as far as the scouting report, you guys didn't give out any scouting report, all video? Nothing. No, no paper. You know, we went green, no paper. Uh, the, the, the videos could be pushed onto their phones uh, via uh, – Lucio has the platform that we used. Um, and then, you know, that, that leads to another one you talk about. So I used uh, my end of game stuff, all my needs stuff, I, I used an iPad. And so what I had on the iPad is basically um, – you know, I whiteboard on the iPad and I load up the play there based on the situation I'd already predetermined, right? Catch and shoot three, uh, need a three side out of bounds. Uh, need a two, uh, I had it, I had it uh, you know, two seconds or less, right? Which was off the catch, right? Two to six seconds or six seconds or more. And so now based on that situation, once I hit, boom, I want to show this play, it's going to come up and the numbers are going to come up and it's going to superimpose onto the, onto the, uh, screen and this is what Nick Nurse uses at the same the same platform. And so now from here, right, I just have to dictate, you know, you, you know, you're the one, you're the two, you're the three. So now and now boom, okay, play it and like, you know, it'll it'll move. Like it's a it's an animated deal. And now if anybody has any issues, I can always pause it and I could draw on it. Right. Which is just like a progressive use of technology. Um, we also had if we had ran that play uh, in practice, we would have that there available as well. Right. So um, half of my job in Phoenix was, was TJ Warren's ATO, uh, hand holder, you know what I mean? And so I'd have, uh, like all of our ATOs would be dialed up. Like I'd have video if we'd ran it before. I mean, there'd be times, I mean, I swear this dude, like, you know, and you know, I have to pull him to the side and be like, yo, uh, TJ, you got that? And he'd be like, no, no, no. What's up, bro? What do we got? And so I'd be like, this is the play. We ran it against New York three weeks ago. Oh yeah, man. I got the corner three. That's my play. All right. That's my jam. Let's roll. <laughs> And, uh, you know, but it's really interesting because it, it can, technology can be overwhelming. So I think you really have to have a focused understanding of how you're going to implement it. If you implement it randomly, I think it can have very negative effects. There's no doubt. Cody, that's a big Go ahead, last part. Last part of that question is how was it with Penny? Because you're coming from the NBA where you have used analytics. So Coach uh, Wilson kind of talked about this earlier. He was a former head coach at uh, Pepperdine. He's now the assistant at uh, Cal Berkeley. And just that's not something that he was as comfortable with. So for Penny, probably the same thing. How did you how did you get him to be more comfortable with using so much analytics within the program? I mean, the thing about Penny that that I mean is probably the best part about working for him is that like he brought me in here for like a reason and like it's very specific. Player development, okay, cool. Uh, uh, offense, okay, cool, and analytics. Like that was an element. And so he's super open minded. You know, he'll call me up. He'll, he wants to know what a lot of this stuff means. He'll call me up to the front of the plane and be like, can you explain this to me a little bit more? Like, let's have a conversation about this element, right? So he's really curious about these types of things. And he wants us to be uh, on the cutting edge. He wants us to be progressive about it. And now our use and implementation of it, right? Like, of course, like there's one guy in the room that's championing it, right? And, but, you know, we're going to talk about whether this is smart, that's smart, you know, like, for instance, using an iPad. I don't even know if it's allowed in the NCAA, but like coach wasn't super comfortable with that. Cool. Like, I mean, his board game is, he's good at it. So that's fine. Um, you know, my job is just to bring him ideas and ways we can probably get better. And then whatever he decides to go with, 
you know, we rock out on. If not, I'll bring him a hundred more ideas tomorrow. And, uh, you know, he's great about uh, wanting to hear all the ideas and then processing them. And then he always like takes some time and comes back to me. And then he's like, okay, I liked out of the, you know, 10, 10 bullet points you hit me with, I kind of, these three are interesting to me. Like, you know, what, tell me a little bit more about these three. And then, you know, we kind of whittle it down from there. So, but, you know, lucky for me, he's, he's pretty progressive about this stuff. Big time. Thanks, man. Cody, I thought that was awesome, man. Good, good to see you too, by the way. Appreciate yeah, you coming you. on. Uh, you know, one little small story about Cody, you know, guys, his energy hasn't changed, you know, since he was a <laughs> prep. And, and, and again, you know, just I wish we had enough time to, to, that these guys would really understand. They probably see Memphis across your chest and go, oh, this big time guy. But how much of a grind that you have grinded to get to where you are and, and, and what you become. And kudos to you, man. I, I, I'm blown away by some of this stuff that you're doing. And, and guys are texting me now, hey, can you ask this? Can you ask that? So I'm going to throw out a few things I, I think are, are tremendous just points. And then I'm going to ask you for a, a, a one thing to show us. But I, I think it's very important that you said earlier that in AU, the wins within the wins. Yeah. Because everybody's program's at a different level. Like I went to Golden State this year and they're not winning any games. But it was a big deal for them at a portion of their season to chart if their post guys were rim running hey, if their guards were getting off the ball more than three dribbles. And so they would chart those things, and when they won it, they would celebrate it because they weren't winning games. And as you know, this the grind of losing games and the frustration of that, and sometimes people not knowing the development piece or are you getting better. And, hey, you may be losing games, but you're getting better in areas. So I think that's a huge piece that analytics can bring that I, I thought was outstanding. Um, the second piece of that deal is that player development stuff is, is off the charts. I mean, to be able not only – for your guys, but we all talk about it in recruiting. Hey, we're going to get you better. Hey, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. And just to be able to present that to someone in their living room of like, hey, this is what Precious did. Hey, this is what James did is, is just is, is outstanding, man. I think you guys are on the on to something there. Um, and then the last thing I would say for you is, is that um, do you have a, a you said you're going to show us a, a, a play card? Yeah. Do you mind showing us a play card? Got it right here. Exactly. And then, and then when you show that play card, what were you talking about when you said menu? Tell me, tell, tell us the difference between the play card and stuff. Is the play card the menu or is there a different terminology that you're using with that? Yeah, no, the play card, the play card is the menu. Um, it is the menu. And so it, it, it changes. I mean, this is like a living organism, right? To, so to the menu changes game. per game, I think is what you were saying. Exactly. You know what I mean? I mean, we can't eat Mexican every night. And I do love my wife's spaghetti, but. <laughs> You know, I mean, if it's every night, you know, I'm probably going to fall out of love with it. So, um, like, so this is the, this is, this is just an example of the menu. We use something very similar uh, in, in Houston, or excuse me, in, uh, in Northern Arizona and in Houston. I mean, actually, so you've got like our overall menu right here, you know what I mean? But then this is the script, tonight's script, if you will. And so we were big, um, this started with, you know, Nick Nurse uh, and, 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 you know, went to Chris Finch who then took it to Kevin McHale, who then, um, you know, we, we convinced Dan Tony to do it on occasion. Uh, but it's uh, first play, second play, right? Like, and a lot of people probably doubt the ability of their players to remember two plays out of a timeout and then to understand when to execute them. But uh, I promise you guys can if it's something that you're interested in. It gives you a little bit more control on an intermediate level. But then what you're doing is if you, if you go this route, you have to release the reins for a significant portion of what you're doing too, right? So what we always did, first play was gonna be uh, like a special. That is not an on-demand play. That is something that, uh, you know, that's gonna be a specific look, right? Like right here, you've got quick double Spain hitch. Okay, so that's gonna be, you know, one of our plays, logical connection based on our terminology. And then the second play is just through, right? So, uh, and that's kind of more just like that little reminder where it's like, I need a little bit more 21 Nash in my life, you know, in wins. And so the first play we're going to come out, you know, maybe we're going to try to hit him, get a three. First play of the game. Second play of the game, we're going to get through, right? That's just this quick second side hitter. Cool. Now we go into the next time out, right? We're going to run five Australia. And the look we're trying to get is a slot drive. We're going to isolate the nail defender and we're going to get a stampede on the slot. Cool. Second play is going to be 21 reset slip. Now, couple interesting things coming out of the timeouts to remember. One, is it your ball coming out of the timeout, right? Because if it's your ball, the next play is the first play. But if it's not your ball and you get a stop, this is where you have to practice this. Your next play might be a transition opportunity. 
don't ever kill the break, right, to go to the look, right? So you want the break because you, because you know, man, if we can score quick, that's, 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 that's going to be good for us. So you give your guys that freedom. So your guys have to understand when do we not have that transition and when do we run the play? Because the other thing is, if you look for the transition, don't get it, you don't want to back it out and then run the play because there's going to be too many unnecessary overlaps. So our general rule of thumb was overlaps are bad, unnecessary and unpurposeful overlaps, right? Overlaps are good in some of our offensive concepts like 21 chase, like pistol action with a purposeful overlap. So what we wanted to do was play random on misses right out of our concepts. But if the next time they made it, that's when we're in first play. And our, and our trigger was one, one equals first play. It's not play one, it's first play. So when, our, when, they, when they made a bucket, our point guard now is going to put up the one and we all know what we're doing. But if you're going to do this, you have to practice this. Like you come, out of a, you come out of a water break, you draw it up. This is where, and that's also how we did all of our special situations uh, out of the water break. Random ass special situations. Nobody knows what they are. And we don't do it so one team runs it and then the next team gets to do the same scenario. We would do two separate scenarios and then we'd, have, we'd cycle through and then two weeks later, the one team that maybe did the need of three is going to, the other team is going to do the need of three. You know what I mean? But um, that also helped us with that flow, knowing when to transition fast break and when to, to run the play. Because we also try to push out a make. So our guys got to feel eventually when to, when to run first play. And then second play is always something that, that they know. So if, if uh, TJ forgot, I would always be able to give him a verbal cue on the second play. Cody, I have a question for you. You just brought something up that was that, that, uh, that's just a good topic that we can discuss a little bit. When I was at New Mexico with Craig Neal, obviously he's got a history of being in the NBA, played in the NBA. He's the only coach that I ever worked for that did draw ups. Mm -hmm. um, everybody else said, hey, if we didn't, if we weren't working on it daily and we, we didn't do it, what's your, what's, what, did you guys, what do you guys do at Memphis? And have you seen that if you do do draw ups, what's the translation as far as? the analytic part of it being successful for you. You know, what's funny about that is like, so we had that conversation like in RGV, like Houston Rockets had us start experimenting with how we were holding the board, right? So they wanted us to come out of timeouts with drops and they wanted us like, <laughs> we would be scripted in one timeout to have the board like this, right? And then he brought, he's going to switch the board and he's going to switch it around. And I'm like, you know, I mean, I'm, it was getting me dizzy, right? right. But, um, you know, I think to me, uh, I am not 100% off of a rand randomization, but to me, we have so much at our disposal that that's what those early morning meetings were with Igor, right? To dial up the ATOs for the night, right? Now, are we going to stick to this script in the fourth quarter? You know what I mean? Like, we're, we're, you, we're typically saying, as long as this is like a one to two possession game, we're going to stick to the script, right? The minute it deviates, we have, we have what we call a panic chart, and so now all of a sudden the game plan shifts. And so now all of a sudden our plays that we want to run shift. And so that whole element, then we've got our crunch time chart, which is close game, you know, this, this, is, this, this is our Bible. And so uh, to me though, I think if you haven't executed it in your script at your shoot around, I tend to shy away from it for sure. That's my general thought. Um, because I think we can plan for a lot of these scenarios at shoot around. Good stuff, good stuff. Hey, Monty, this is Marty. I got a question for Cody. Cody, this is Marty Wilson up at uh, Cal yeah. Berkeley. So, Coach. I'm, 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 good, man, good, good. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at your, your play card, um, hearing just your terminology, and probably some people would get lost in some of this. And uh, I worked for Jim Boylan, who's with, uh, with the Bulls now, uh, his first year at Utah. And he, he, he elected me initially the uh, offensive coordinator. And I had never been in a system in college in all my years where you had an offensive coordinator and defensive coordinator. And we had so many plays that it became overwhelming for me. And I had been in college for, in coaching for a while. So let alone our players understanding it. But the way he explained it to me is not worry about the, the, the play. It's the action, and you talked about some of that. Can we get uh, a Nash out of out of out of? I think he's called a shoulder out of twenty one. Can we get a this or this or this? Can you explain more about that? And that simplified everything for me once once he taught me that. 
Yeah. So um, it's funny because you're exactly right. Like this whole deal here could be like overwhelming. Like how are all our guys going to, we're going to remember this. So some of the keys that Igor was big on was, was we called them families or formations, right? So out of our different formations now, uh, there was always a logical connection between every play. So if you set it in your mind, you are going to know the play. So for instance, uh, let's just take a look at five Australia slot drive. So five, that means you're going to be in our delay five out formation. That's the first, the first one, Australia, right? That was our terminology for a, a down screen into an up screen or an under screen, which down under Australia, right? And then slot drive was the action that we were looking for. So Igor was huge on a logical connection between everything. And to me, that's the biggest. The scoring action is always the last one. So we would always go family, or excuse me, formation slash family, all right? We would go uh, essentially from there, we would go you know, to your play type, and then we would go to your scoring action. And the scoring action part ends up being the most important part. And that's how, how uh, we were able to try to disguise as many, that's how, that's how the NBA teams are disguising all their ATOs. Because if they come out of the same formation, and that's also how, um, if you mess it up, something good will happen. The minute you start throwing different formations, I'm the four man, I got to be on the right elbow. I'm the four man, I got to be in the left corner. I'm the four man, I got to be in the right. I'm the four man, I got to, on this specific play, for this play to work, our four man has to be in this spot, right? That, can, that provides a level of inflexibility then that can, that can handcuff you. If you stay in the same formation, even if the shit goes terribly wrong, typically you'll see something you're familiar with and then you can reevaluate. And I'll show you guys, I'll show you guys actually our, so like our Phoenix playbook, how we had it all, how we have it all uh, diagrammed here. So PH. Any more questions while I'm finding this? Yeah, I got a question, Cody. Can you guys yep. hear me? Kevin Hubby, San Francisco. Yes. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is really interesting. And we, we do, I would say, a lot of the same stuff. Um, at San Francisco. And one of the things that, that we have run into um, over the years when tracking like play calls um, and also direct action is just the lack of sample size in order to make a decision, um, a coaching decision. And that's where I think it generally in the world of analytics and in college basketball specifically, um, you can get yourself in trouble a little bit if you're looking at, looking at data that is low sample size and trying to make those decisions. And that's where like when you talked about, like, I think Marty was just talking about, um, like, direct actions as opposed to play calls, we found to be more valuable, especially in college, because, you know, you're only playing a 40-minute game and 30 games, so about 12, 1,200 minutes, whereas, you know, in the NBA, it's about four times that. So you just get a lot more data. And the games are faster because the shot clock, so you're getting more, more data points. So I was just interested to think, to see what you think about what's a, what's a good number of, for example, of possessions for, in, in order to, you know, be able to have a, be confident that, all right, this play call works, this play call doesn't work. Um, and then the other thing that I was interested in with your experience in the NBA is like, you know, from what I know about the NBA, from the people that, that I'm close with, like the coverages, as you, as you mentioned, like you guys, there's more coverages in the, in the NBA. Um, and maybe that just like in pick and roll coverages, for example, um, maybe that's just having having better players and higher basketball IQ. But with all the data, and again, a lot of the data, we look at very similar things in scouting and with our own team. Like we still only have three different pick and roll coverages. And even when we're going against a team that we know is, could be really good in the pick and roll or a certain player, or we're still probably just going to stay with what we do and live with the results. And I'm interested to, to see what you think about that idea of trying to change something going into a game where analytically you know that, oh, we're going against a point guard who's incredible in the middle pick and roll. What, would, you, would you try to change that at Memphis versus what you would try to do if you were still working in the NBA? Yeah, um, good, 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 very good question. So number one is I'll say, yeah, try playing like drop coverage against Steph Curry and they move the level of the screen, you know, retardedly high, force yeah. your guy over the screen and he pulls that three, right? So, you know, it's a, it's a chess match. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer. I know that's not what anybody ever wants to hear, right? But to me, there's a lot of feel behind it. And there's also a lot of feel behind whether or not you think a play is going to work. Um, you know, and, and so 
that's why I feel like the next thing is like, if you just take the data and you just say, Hey, like, okay, like we score one point, you know, two points per possession on this play. Oh man, this is a radical play. This is an amazing play. But like, you got to evaluate, you know, the quality of the shots that you're getting and then the coverage that you're going against. And so I think when you separate into those types of things, right, like plays that you run for pick and rolls versus ice coverage, right? Well, there's two things you can do against ice coverage. You can try to break the coverage by getting to the middle, or you can accept the coverage and have your solution be acceptance based, right? And so to me, um, I think you've got to prepare for both, right? Because if the coverage is killing you, you've got to have a check down and an adjustment. But in the same sense, if I watch a play be ran two, three, four times and like book gets a pretty good shot, doesn't make it, I'm still, I still might feel pretty good about this play. So that's why to me, volume, if it's going to go into our playbook, I already feel like it's going to work if it's going to go into the playbook. So now volume to me just becomes playing the game is, yeah, you think these mother efforts have seen it or not? You think they'll remember it? Can we get them on that, you know, back door? Because I mean, hell, Murray State knew that Belmont was going to do that damn back door this year. I right? felt bad for 10 Kane, you know, because they still got him on it at the end of the game. Right. So it's kind of like, to me, like, I, I just, and, and it comes back to how I have this set up. So I'll just show you guys right here. Right. So you got families. So here are all our different families. So we've got our own open family, pistol, stack, horns, diagonal, all these different families. But then you've got the actions. Here's the actions, right? Quick action, shoulder, snap, post-ups, post the pass, spinulas, stampede action, verse zone, kamikaze, hammers, Kansas, lobs, logos, gates, flares, finlands, drags, corner pins. You know what I mean? Like, it goes on and on. But, like, this is how we put the, the whole deal together, right? And so, and then you've got, like, our end-of-game stuff, our packages. So, it, it gets, it gets expensive, it, it extensive, however – when you go to the actual action at the end, like Barca action, or which, which uh, for us is like a, it's, I mean, it's coming from Barcelona. It's like a double zipper, Chicago action, like screening the dunk spot guy. Like at the very end of the day with our guys, they will know these actions and we will break these down. And it comes back to our player development. You really want to know how to coach out action based. You got to be player development, read and react based. And you got to layer up how you do that. And you got to do more combo work, which I think is where the majority of the time, the time teams, too, too much post perimeter. Like you, if I'm rolling all the time and Boogie Ellis is throwing me pocket passes, we're building a chemistry. And that's the difference between when I was playing overseas too, like in Spain and everything, it's all combo work. And hell, they got the centers like coming off the pick and rolls. So you're building chemistry with these guys. Cody. Back to on demand on the back right here. Need situations right here. Um, you know, and then some of our stuff like for in game, like what's cooking, what converted. So. Cody, I um, and this goes along with Kevin. With Kevin, you were saying too, like I've struggled with trying to create like sort of a shot quality for us as well with our sets and with our motion. So I kind of just made it sort of an off-season project to go in and look. And again, the kind of issue of sample size comes up because maybe we ran a certain action at the end of a clock 18 times on the year, and we were really successful at getting a good shot off um, or drawing a foul, and all that kind of factors in, but. How do you, obviously without second spectrum, without like a quantified shooter impact score that's generated in college, is it just something you kind of have to do manually? Like, I mean, in games, I'm tracking our offensive possession, so I'm tracking what we're running. Uh, we kind of moved to a more motion-based offense this year where we didn't call as many sets. Um, and coach kind of felt, uh, you know, to sort of – lessen the joystick ability of the game this year and felt really strongly about that. And so that's what we did. And I mean, we ran our motion where we essentially didn't call a set uh, 467 possessions this year. So about 16 possessions a game we, where we weren't really calling anything. Uh, yeah. then there's tra and we also played only about 65 possessions a game. So we were 350th in pace yeah. um, and transition, you know, and then, and then there's like specific sets we ran, but like, for instance, drags, like we were 1.18 point per possession on drags this year. Like we were just really good at it for whatever reason, probably because we had the player of the, league, uh, player of the year just getting in the paint and scoring. But um, I guess that's long winded to just say like, how do you in college, are you just like manually kind of doing that? Like, like when it comes to shot quality create, are you just, is it more um, arbitrary or like what's a good proxy for, for shot quality? So this is what we're going to go to next year. Um, something I've given a lot of thought to, right, is I'm going to go to a five-point scale. Just keep it simple, right? Yeah. 
So we're going to run the play. And so obviously, like, we're going to keep track of that. And after the game's over and I go back through and I'm reviewing, um, I'm just going to say, hey, scale of, scale of one to five, five being a great shot, like, you know, just what was it? Yeah. That's going to give us some, some data point, right? I mean, it's going to be subjective in nature, but, um, you know, some of the second spectrum data too, I mean, it's their closeout situation is all XY based, right? Like it's just proximity based. It's not hand up, hand down, right? Because we all know if I'm standing right there in front of Damian Lillard, this dude ain't missing, right? So, um, you know, I think that the point five point scale is going to be my go-to. Um, and, and that's it. And then, you know, I'm going back and reviewing all of our stuff from this year and trying to see, well, certain ones, why didn't these certain ones, like what, what did we do wrong? Are we not good at screening angles? Are we not good at getting out of the screen? Are we not good at holding the advantage when we get the advantage in the pick and roll, you know, and then that's kind of shaping some of our player development stuff whenever, uh, you know, whenever we can get back on the court. Yeah, that's good. I, as a follow-up to that also, and Kevin, I'd be curious to hear what you say too, is like, because when I was doing it, I did a five-point scale as well when I was going through our quality and um, there were certain actions that I thought were like really close to like four, like, you know, 4.0 or so, which was really good. Um, drags being one of them. And I want like, do you. Well, let me, let me interject right there too. So yeah. I would separate, this is how I'm separating it. Right. So okay. you've got to play that results in an action where that action results in hopefully a catch and shoot. Mm -hmm. Then you've got plays, right, where that action results in a post-up. Is it a post to score or is it post to pass, right? Because those shouldn't be coincidental. And then you've got action that can result in what we call stampedes at the NBA level, right? So at the NBA, you're usually coming out of a timeout. You are going to try to create a rim attempt or a catch and shoot three, right? And then you've got what we call organic stuff, like you're talking about your drags, right? So the quality of shot in your drag is, very, is based on so many other variables, mm -hmm. right? So you rate your drag four. Well, but, but, but what you got to rate it in, in several different categories, ball handler four, roller four, and then you've got to do, is it direct or indirect? Because yeah. to me, I'm going to rate, I'm, I'm, and I, this is actually what I'm doing, rating our drags on ball handler quality, right? So that becomes score pass decision. Roller quality, that becomes, did you roll restricted, short roll, whatever, catch, no catch, finish, no finish, or... Pass to roll man, pass to corner, pass to corner, and one more pass, right? right. So anything that is, that is more than two passes out of the pick and roll, null and void, that drag didn't work. But if we create a shot, right, on zero passes, one pass, or two passes, now we've got to rate that shot with a subset. Right. Um, what, I was, what I was actually – what I was getting to is, like, it's just you looking at this, correct? Like, I mean, Kevin, kind of like you were talking about, like, you're the only guy kind of looking at that yeah. specific thing. Like, you're not getting a – a set of three or four eyes on that to average a score. It's like, this no. is my, you know, subjective. No, I, I wanted to jump in too. And obviously this is getting like pretty, pretty <laughs> nerdy and high level. <laughs> right. uh, the five points. Let me scale, get my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> I've been, so the five point scale is really interesting. And I've been doing that for the past three years in addition to our hustle stats. And yeah. so like, I'll just, I'll just share this one more time. So this is something that, I was thinking about talking about today, but if you guys can see that. So this is how I do it. And uh, the, where are we? Final possession quality. Um, so this is my scale. Like here's these green are fives. And these are like uncontested threes off the catch, uncontested layups. Mm -hmm. And I go down, fours are still good. And then threes are okay shots. And then twos are pretty much all mid range. And then ones and zeros are like different kinds of turnovers. And so that's how I do it. And this is like my method. This is the totals of each day. But, like, for example, this was our game at Gonzaga. And every game, every half-court possession. So when we don't get transition, and I don't track transition just because I think one thing that skews the data is, like, if you get a steel dunk, like, I don't really care. I don't, I don't think I can coach that. I just think that's having good players or making a good defensive play. So this is every half-court possession. I'll just say, do you, you mind if I interject on that part, right? Like, so I agree, right? So we classified that as numbers. Numbers advantage break, right, is not, not going to count for us as uh, transition, right? So basically our early offense yeah. is transition. Yeah, that's great. So you're taking – you're basically taking those possessions out, which I think is great. Yes. Um, and I, I've done it before. The first year I did it, I kept transition. And then I realized after the year, I was like, all right, I need to break this out into half court because mm -hmm. I can't coach this. I need to figure out what I can coach. But that's – this is my process. So, like, here's the game. This is the possession number. Um, and then what happened? So the BTO is bad turnover, but like, what was the end of the possession? And then the quality is the zero through five scale. 
which player ended the possession. And then these are, did we get a paint touch? And how did we get that paint touch? Whether it was a drive, post feed, the X is no paint touch, what happened? And then I, I added offensive rebound, which is a different thing. But that's like, so my final for, and this is just this year, and I have it across all three years on every specific type of shot you can kind of see. Mm-hmm. So like, I think it's pretty valuable. And just when you guys started talking about the, the scale, I figured I had to jump in just the. Oh, that's out. awesome. That's stuff, great man. stuff, man. That's, that's great awesome. stuff, Kevin. Yeah. Hey, Kevin, I got a question for you. Um, yeah. I know Cody does the, the player development and, and seen some of his stuff. Do you spearhead your player development there at San Francisco? I know college is a little, I mean, I know, I, I feel like Memphis is, is a. What's up, coach? They're doing some NBA type shit. Oh, <laughs> and yeah. so I know they're a little bit different, but I don't know college and I kind of know Todd's background. Are yeah. you kind of spearheading the. When I say spearheading, like, hey, I, I may not be in charge of the workout, but if, if we're going to do some offensive stuff, yeah, I'm going to tell them what we're kind of how we're scripting it today. Yep, I, I would say so. Like, because I do, like, we do the coordinator system here. So, um, and Kyle does it too. So I was kind of Kyle's offensive coordinator, and like the hoodie was with us, um, obviously, but like he wanted to. I, I have a lot of experience in the Princeton offense because I played in it. So that's why he kind of decided he wanted to go that way. So that kind of became organic. But yeah, a lot of the stuff we do in individual workouts is is uh, based on like Cody was talking about the actions, you know, so you're, just like Girl of Sin was doing for you. I'm sure at San Diego, I know it, you know, he was, I'm sure a lot of stuff and even like watching you guys pregame, I always like watching San Diego pregame, like they were out there getting all different kinds of shots and, it, you know, it's, it's kind of the same stuff, I yeah. would say. Yeah. Yeah, I got a question. Uh, first off, man, y'all, this high level, like this, is, <laughs> this is real new to me. But uh, I appreciate y'all taking y'all time to break a lot of this information down. Um, my head coach who's, who's is talking? Lord. who's talking. Oh, it's uh, Mike Scott, assistant over oh, at Kyle State Bakersfield. Bakersfield. Yeah. Um, my my head coach is a defensive minded, like to the core type of person. Um, could you guys, and this is probably for you know the, the three guys that talk, Adam, Cody, and uh, Kevin. Could you guys give, I guess, your t- uh, top three to five categories? Because I'm just starting out with analytics and kind of recording all of this stuff, and we don't have a big staff. But I do want to get into, uh, I guess, your top three to five defensive uh, things to stat um, as far as collecting data and dealing with your team, as far as the, the, the things that you've had success with. Let's do, let's do all three. Uh, uh, let's go Adam first, if you don't mind, then go Kevin, then go Cody. Yeah. Perfect. No, go ahead. Running. I wasn't bent. I'm, I'm over here dealing with my little kid. But uh, yeah. <laughs> just, repeat, just repeat the question real quick because he's over here. He's, he's acting what's, up. Your, what's your top three or five defensive analytical uh, kind of measuring points that you uh, evaluate when you're defending slash evaluate your team, how you defend it slash going into scouting? Yeah. So, like, if you, if you would say – I'll jump in if you want. If you, if go, you ahead, was, go ahead, if you, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, yeah, I would say the transition is first. So, like, if you have rules for your guys that when they when it you know you miss a shot or turn the ball over and they have to get back, like just a negative for if they don't do their job in transition, and then pick and you know pick and roll coverages. You know, I think that's the the next thing. So, like, obviously your bigs and guards are going to be different. Mm-hmm. Um, just if they met, if somebody screws up a a coverage. Um, or get screened, just just hit them with a negative. I think that that just those two things I think are probably the most two most important things defensively. Um, just being good in transition and ball screen coverages. Okay, yeah, no, I'm ready now. Uh, we track kills, and that's obviously three stops in a row. That's usually the game momentum. Our magic number last season was six, and that gave us uh, like a 94 percent chance to win. Uh, we didn't get that a lot, <laughs> so we didn't do that well this year as we should have. Uh, but I'd say kills, uh, paint touches, and the result. You know, again, we did that offensively and defensively where we given up paint touches, and then contested versus uncontested shots. Like those were three things that that, and we also went even in, but we tracked more. We cracked post post touches and what the result was, and then live ball turnovers versus dead ball turnovers, and that goes both ways if we can. Our coach would like to be disruptive. We weren't very good defensively, so it was hard for us. But if we could be disruptive and we can get, like like Kevin was saying and Cody was saying, we get some runouts, you know, some easy buckets where we don't do anything and just have hopefully have good players to do that. Okay. 
Yeah, I think all those things are good. Uh, kills, like we tracked that as well. Um, we had a uh, defensive accountability uh, uh, kind of code window, right? And, and that also, it, there, it pick and roll, transition, but then the other subset was cycle of help, right? And so cycle of help was like low man responsibilities, crackback responsibilities. Uh, and then the last thing was finish the play. Uh, and so, you know, basically if you go through there, you know, you, you, you calculate, uh, you know, and, and can give a guy a grade based off of that. And so like our video coordinator in uh, Phoenix did defensive accountability. Uh, I did, uh, I did the offensive stuff. And then, um, you know, we, our guys would get like a grade, right? And so, you know, he, he would basically tag every time, like you were low man, right? So those were your opportunities. And then outside your opportunities, like, like you were either successful or unsuccessful, right? And so then, you know, that was what we did. Uh, we also, you know, we did it on pick and roll as well, right? Like, so your, your, you know, subset of the pick and roll is not just whether they scored or didn't score, right? Like, so our first one was like on the ball. All right. So obviously you can't tell if they're communicating on the film, really, you can kind of tell maybe, but it's uh, first step into the ball. So did we jam, right? On the call, did we jam the ball to put us into, to, to escort the guy into the coverage? And then depending on like our principles, like, you know, if, if it's like, you know, are we drop in the middle or it, so if we're drop, right? Like where do we want our big, right? Was, if your guys are supposed to be up to touch or whatever, right? This would be where you rate them on their touch point. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, then, you know, if a guy's going downhill, like we have beer back terminology, right? Which would be like a switch below the foul line. Did you get it below the foul line? Did we switch it or not switch it? And so it's like, those are, you kind of just, just working backwards from whatever your coach likes, right? Like the low man baseline driver, you trapping outside the box, like traditional or whatever. Like if that's the case, that could be a point that you could chart, you know, now that the key is right. Like Lamont talked about is, you know, his staff at, at San Diego is different than our staff in the Phoenix Suns. You know sure. what I mean? Like, I mean, um, and this is where I would, I would say that Steve Donahue has done a great job of really tapping into the resources that he has by the aspiring, uh, you know, analytics junkies at the University of Pennsylvania that are all, you know, they're in the Wharton School of Business and they're all trying to, you know, maybe they want to be GM, maybe you want to be the next Sam Presti, right? So there might be somebody at your computer sciences department that's playing Fortnite and thinking about analytics. So can you find that dude? Good point. Real quick, Al, I wanted to jump this to you um, too, because obviously I work with you at UTEP, and I think the win within the win, you did a great job of introducing that with our team as we were kind of building a culture there, and then also some of the things defensively that you thought were important because uh, you really changed the whole defensive approach from San Diego and where you were in your early years versus your last year. So what are some of the things that you kind of kept track of? Well, I think it's, it's, it's really kind of based off some of the analytics. I mean, I think if you think about the game, and we've kind of shared this with guys as we, you know, we did our defensive stuff, but what kind of shots do you want on offense? I, I want to I lay up, I want to dunk, I want to free throw, and I want a wide open three, you know, or a wide open shot. You know, really, I say a wide open three because I hate twos, um, but that's just me personally. So w within that, you know, we had our five pillars of defense, which, which I shared, you know, um, with guys. And so, you know, we didn't want shit in the paint. You know, I've seen Kevin's stuff if, you know, on offense, did they get to the paint? And, and as I was watching some of their stuff in the paint, you look at the other column and it's made three, layup, uh, free throw. You know, so we tried to keep guys out of the paint. You know, we wanted guys, we, we endorsed guys playing uh, twos over hands. And, and that's why I love that premise. You know, Cody talked about two versus two versus ball screens. You know, in the West Coast Conference, if you're going to, I mean, you're going to try to tag ball screens, you know, between St. Mary's, San Francisco, Gonzaga, they're going to light your ass up because they, they know all the ball screen reads. They're going to throw back. And they're, if you're tagging from the pair side like St. Mary's does, they're going to hit you in the corner. I mean, you're just, you're just going to give up so many threes. So we didn't want guys – we didn't want – we didn't want paint touches. We wanted uh, uh, guys uh, twos over hands. We weren't giving up threes. Obviously, you got to finish – you got to finish stops. You know, you got to finish stops with rebounds, which we weren't very good at it at, uh, at uh, San Diego because we we're so small and not that tough. Um, and, and keep guys off the free throw line. And so I, I just think, you know, it's those things that I think that came back to the analytics in a lot of ways that Adam has shown and Cody has shown and, and Kevin has shown. But again, I think it's, it's, it's who you are. What, what, do you, what do you want? How do you want to play? You have to be authentic within yourself. And, and that's who we were. That's what we, you know, we just, we stayed steadfast with those things. And so Coach Terry was great, allowing me to bring those things to UTEP. 
and I thought it did help us. And I thought it was consistent. You know, it's, it's not something that changes every game or changes this. It's like Cody said, you know, they have their coverages in defense, and that's what they do. You do what you do. And then tell real quick about the win within the, within the win. Oh, uh, yeah. After the game, kind of how we celebrated different things. Or, you know, even if, even if you didn't win necessarily, and talk about how you built it at San Diego real quick. Yeah, so we just had, you know, we had the six goals, you know, uh, the field goal percentage, uh, made threes, uh, three-point field goal percentage, kills. And so after every game, you know, that we won, uh, and some games that we lost, we'd address it if, you know, hey, we didn't, we didn't do this, uh, you know, we would let them know. But really, we celebrated after games. And really why we celebrated after games is, is the buy-in. You know, so we got the guy who we thought was – you know, the key key guy to the game. And it didn't necessarily be, mean the guy who scored the most points. And we give them the marker and say, hey, coach would have a stat sheet and say, what'd they shoot? Or a guy would say, what'd they shoot from the field? Oh, they shot 35. And it was a big deal. They say, check. And everybody jumped up and celebrated. Yeah, yeah, we won that one. How many threes did they get? Oh, Cal got two. Oh, check. We won that one. And so it just became a, a buy-in deal and also became a guys were thinking like at halftime they come in and say you know most guys at halftime they want to see the stat sheet how well, my numbers coach but now they're going hey coach how many threes they got hey what hey where are we at on the boards are we plus on the boards where, where are we at and so again it's just selling what's so it's important to your program and making guys buy in but I thought again we did that really well if I had it to go back again I think I would do it with wins and losses you know because again I thought when we got uh, what was it, uh, three out of the five, what was it, no, it was uh, six categories. When we got four out of the six categories, we won 84% of our games. And so, again, you know, that, that number to me, part of analytics is like, fuck, I'm not that smart. I'm not, a, I'm not completely an analytics guy, but I know I want to win 84% of my games. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah, so, yes. Right? So, if we're going to do those things, then 84 is pretty damn good. We'll be having some beers after the game. <laughs> All right, we're going to wrap this up, fellas. We'll take one more question, and then we'll thank these guys, and then we'll wrap it up. I guess, Cody, I guess I'll get, I'll get you a, a question. I know you, you showed me that, uh, like, app, the player development app. Uh, now, as far as the, the evolution of that player development app, what, what does that app actually generate? You know what I mean? Because again, you, you have all these reports and all this stuff. It's like, how much of that stuff are you typing in? How much stuff is that? Okay, is that generating for you? Because I'm like, you know what I mean? Like again, y'all have these extensive reports, and you know, it's almost yeah, like they're auto they're auto generated, right? So everything's loaded into the back end. I mean, and uh, and then just whenever you want to run them, honestly, there we, we've got it to where they're on the next iteration of the app. They're going to be real time available on your phone. So you can pull up anybody's workout report and you're going to be able to dial in on different things and dates. Um, so yeah, you don't, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a master. I mean, now don't get me wrong. Maybe I'm better than the average dude at Excel, but like, I'm no, I'm no wizard. You know what I mean? And so to me, like, uh, that's why all of our stuff that we're doing, uh, the majority of it is going to be auto generated. And, um, that's why, you know, I, like I've got a, a dude who, uh, was an intern with the Sacramento Kings who does analytics for a hospital. Like I've got two dudes who work remotely. One just finished his data analytics degree at uh, UMass, uh, his master's. And so like these dudes work remotely for free. And like right now I'm trying to help muscle my guy, Alex in Nebraska has like an analytics job open. So I'm trying to help him out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. and he got some great practical experience uh, helping us build our processes, like our in-house ones, like our pre and post game reports. Mm -hmm. um, but those are all tapped into the various data vendors. And so like, we pull a lot of stuff from the play-by-play, -play, you know, because oh, yeah. everybody's got play-by-play. -play. Like, y'all got access to it. So now you just get – we just get an XML of the play-by-play -play sent to him, and, and basically it goes to, a, to an email address, and he does – and it just goes right into our system. Wow. Hey, can you tell me what you told him? Because I have a guy – I found a guy that, that wants to do this. He's, like, volunteering to do things. Yeah. I just don't know how to – how to, you know what I mean, like, focus him to, to something, you know, like that you – You've yeah, so, so the first thing, like when I when we started, so number one is like I just had I, I felt like I was the Wizard of Oz, right? Um, when I got to when I got to uh, Houston, right? Because I'm like, like everybody want to know what this Daryl Morey character is up to, besides you know tweeting out the China stuff and costing NBA billions of dollars. But like you know everybody want to know what he's got, what's this dude doing, right? You know what I mean? And like you know they actually have like a Princeton football player over there who named Monty McNair, who's like their guy. And so like I got tight with Monty and like you know 
uh, Mac, uh, Kevin McHale didn't want to see the whole reports. You know what I mean? Like I was thirsty for, I was like, show me this whole thing, man. It's like a 50 page report, right? They got this, the, the, the dude who actually makes the, the Houston Rockets run is this dude named Fan Hall. And he like sits in a dark room. I don't think there are any windows. I mean, he definitely partakes in some illegal drugs, but, um, but he's just like at a computer. I mean, it's like Facebook, like you see with the headphones on. And it's like, <laughs> this dude is out here like coding up and producing these 50 page reports. And so, um, you know, I, I just, I got close with him and I just started learning bit by bit. And so when I went to Northern Arizona, they didn't have any analytics in place. And so I convinced them to allow me uh, to, to bring on an intern who then got access to the information because the NBA teams have the information. Second Spectrum has been providing the data, but it's all about what you do with it, right? Yeah. Um, and so then, um, you know, we basically, I had my visuals from Houston. I said, I want this. And now he's able to figure out how to do it. So if you want to get with me, I'll, I'll, I'll be happy to show you, hey, like these are some yeah. ideas. Yes. And then it's like, you want this? This is what you want to show your guy. Yes. And now he's got to reverse engineer how to do that. Yes. And that, you've got to help your guys get better at did a Tim ever get better at free throw shooting? Slightly, slightly. <laughs> he, he actually, I mean, he was better his junior year than he was his, his senior year, but he graduated. That was the big thing. Like school is not his deal, man. I and he, he's just back in Australia. You sent a little video. Yeah. He's doing great, man. He, he's, no, I appreciate that too. I mean, again, yeah. he was, he was, he helped us. He helped good. us. Good, good. Well, guys, man, that was outstanding. You know, appreciate everything, uh, Hoodie. Uh, um, Kevin and, and Cody and everybody who else who jumped in and this is, this is tremendous stuff and again I, I, I say this every week you know we're obviously all forced to be kind of doing this right now because we're in quarantine and different things are going on but but I challenge you guys you know to how do you how are you going to maintain this and how are you going to work on yourself and continue to grow whenever we, it's life back to usual and, and you want to be good you want to be Cody you want to be Kevin you want to be at you got to invest man and, and nobody's going to invest more than, than yourself. Nobody's going to bet on yourself more than yourself. So challenge yourself, man. Spend time. If it's Sundays, whatever it may be, you know, that, that you're off days. I know you got jobs to do, but this is what, what it takes to get good and, 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 and actually also help our game grow and help our young men and, yeah. women, and women. I want to just uh, give the floor real quick to, to Coach Taylor, Division One head coach, and Marty Wilson. If you had any closing thoughts before I, we close it in prayer, just wanted to – let you guys have the mic real quick since you guys are uh, are, are, are uh, other experts on the call. I'm not an expert. No, I, know, I know you're on the beach over there, D. I know hey. you're on the beach. I forgot I didn't have my hat on. God damn, I look like a mess. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll go real quick and I'll let the knowledgeable Coach Wilson close this thing out. And the first thing I'll say is, man, this information is almost overwhelming. It's so good. It's unbelievable. And like Coach Smith said, um, it, it's imperative that you don't try to be someone else. It's imperative that you take what's relevant for you, whether you're an assistant coach or a head coach, to try to help make sense of this stuff because you could easily get lost in the translation and end up not knowing your ass from a hole in the ground in a lot of ways. But um, like Coach Smith said, I think these types of opportunities are, are few and far between. I applaud everybody for getting on here and spending the time and investing in yourself and trying to build your own brand and your own craft. I think these are the ways to do that. Um, and I also think that not only is it important for us to acquire this information, but it's also important for us to organize it and apply it. That's always the hard part is, is you get all this information and you, you start right, your mind starts racing. And then an hour or two later, you, you forgot applying what, you just learned and so I would encourage everybody to do that um, and continue to have these types of conversations man this stuff is powerful just when you think you you got something nicked and you you got a good understanding somebody like Cody comes and just slaps the shit out of you with information that you've never heard of before um, but again it's it's just phenomenal and and also to grow our game but we're dealing with a group of young men and young ladies that this is the way they communicate from a technological standpoint and so if you aren't getting involved in learning how to translate these different types of languages, you might get lost in the shuffle. And so again, I think it's imperative for everybody to pitch in and do what you can to, to be relevant in this space, because this, this is the way that the trends are, are going. I appreciate you acknowledging myself and allow me to say something, man, but, but that, this, is, this is powerful, dude. Super duper powerful. Cody, I appreciate you, Adam. Kevin, man, God damn. Wow. I put something on there too. Um, last week I, I took a class in coding 
uh, from one of my buddies, uh, really all about, you know, the sports analytics stuff. And, and so he's starting up a business and he's, he's a guy who used to coach college basketball, Aaron Warren McQueen, and he's doing terrific stuff uh, for the community in the Bay Area and across the world. And I jumped on this coding class and the coding class was based out of, it was like a camp out of Toronto. And I was obviously the oldest guy, the, 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 the youngest, the, the oldest guy next to me on the, on the call was, was 12 years old. <laughs> and they had like 25, 30 kids on there. So again, what Dietrich said, you know, you got to sometimes get, get with the program where you get left behind. Well, I'll, uh, I'll throw my two cents. Uh, Marty, as, as you just talked about being the oldest guy on, the, on that one, uh, I might be the oldest one on this one, other than Calvin Burr. He looks like he's 90. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hey, but he was a McDonald's All-American. He's a baller, man. He's a baller. His name is in the baller. rafters up at St. Joe's. Um, again, like, like, like Coach Taylor said, a little overwhelming for me uh, because I don't know it. And that's, that's, that's why I sat in. I'm glad I did. I had my little audio recorder sitting next to it so I can go back and, and, and listen to it again. Um, there was so much information. Again, I'm going to reach out to you guys to, to, to try to learn more. Um, I have a son who's a GA. He wants to get in this crazy freaking business. And I'm trying to talk him out of it like I've tried other people. But he's smarter than I am. Uh, he understands this stuff. He used to try to beat me upside the head. He was a manager for me uh, a few years ago at Pepperdine, and he's gotten better um, working with Tom Crean and their staff. And, and, and they, have a, they, they have more people like you, you, you talked about, Cody, uh, to be able to break all these things down. So he's learned it um, a lot more and, and more receptive. When I was starting, I was the third assistant restricted earning. We didn't do any of this shit. Um, so it's, it's new for me. It is a little overwhelming, but I'm, I'm, I'm eager to learn. Uh, I, I don't have all answers on anything. And so the game has changed as recruiting has changed from bird when we started to what it is now. And, uh, we have to be able to adjust and I'm willing to adjust. So I, 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 I again, I wish I had a hat, take my hat off to you guys, you young guys. Uh, for progressing the game. And, and as Coach Taylor said, share it, man, share it. We don't do enough in the college game, as in Cody, you've been a part at, at that other level. We don't do enough of this to teach, to share, to steal from other people. And we think we have all the answers in recruiting and coaching and, and all that's that bullshit. We're still in it from everybody else. So use it, share it, ask a million questions. Uh, I think our staff probably gets tired of me because I make our, our, our meetings go longer because I want to know why. I want to know what we're doing. So if I know what we're doing, when we're doing it, why we're doing it, I know how to explain it to our guys. So, so continue to share, continue to learn, to continue to grow. And, and, and once you think that you're too big for the game, get out because it's going to bite you in the ass. Well, fellas, so we, uh, we do this every week, same time. Uh, we've changed it now where it's the same link, so you don't have to worry about it. if you get the link, if you don't get the link, same time. Uh, next week we'll have Coach Wilson on to share with us some of his experience along with uh, Coach Jerome Chang, Associate Head Coach at Baylor. So please feel free to join us every week. Bring a friend. We want to just keep sharing and growing and learning as best we can. So that being said, um, bow your heads. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this awesome, awesome, powerful time uh, together to fellowship in the game we love. Thank you for Kevin. Thank you for Adam. Uh, thank you for Cody. Uh, we pray that you continue to bless them as they continue to grow their careers and their staffs and their organizations and their programs. Uh, bless all that they are doing in their programs. Uh, bless both Kevin and Adam with their newborn um, children, uh, learning fatherhood and bless them with some extra sleep, hopefully. Uh, and then just bless all of us to be protected and be safe as we continue to open the uh, the country back up more and more and continue to be able to do more things. We just continue to be safe, mindful of those um, uh, that may be more at risk for this COVID and then just continue to help us uh, just to be mindful of you, Lord, and all we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Uh, have a great weekend. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, fellas. Thanks, fellas. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Right.